Yeah. Islam is the religion of mercy, but it is also, and above all, the religion of truth. And truth is pitiless in that it cannot be other than it is. There is no way in which black can become white so as to appease the grief of a human soul. Not even God, for all his omnipotence, can choose to make error into truth. The relationship between truth and mercy is therefore the most complex relationship in the whole theater of creation. And even beyond this theater, in the principles which govern it. If a balance is possible, it can be held steady only by the prophets, the sages, and the saints. The rest go this way or that, to one extreme or the other. In the history of Christianity, as in that of Islam, there have been men of for whom only truth mattered and who could not see that truth itself when crystallized in earthly formulations and dogmas may become relative and therefore subordinate to a higher wisdom or to the law of love and mercy. The Inquisition burned its heretics and Hajjaj slaughtered his rebels. But there have also been men, and they seem to predominate in contemporary Christian circles, who think only of love and mercy and would like to banish from religion the sword of discrimination, which divides truth from error until eventually truth is compromised. And for this very reason, mercy becomes hollow and impotent a sentimentality which has no roots in the heart's core where truth eternally resides. That was uh, from Charles Guy Eaton, Islam and the Destiny of Man. Oh, wow, that's a non-Muslim. I thought that was... A... Wow, that's pretty phenomenal. And he's Muslim? He's Muslim. He's a convert. Oh, he's oh, okay. Whenever I tell, whenever I, this is, whenever I, uh, whenever non-Muslims, Westerners, ask about Islam, I actually warn them against picking up a Quran. I tell them two books to pick up first. Primarily, Islam and the Destiny of Man by Charles Guy Eden. He was a personal friend of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. He was a British diplomat. He converted to Islam, and um, this book sets the stage. Because he he um, he divided it into three parts. The first one is an approach to faith, to faith, where he um, sets the stage. You as a non-Muslim, there are all these metaphysical and philosophical assumptions that you have. Let me work them out for you. Let me just set them explicitly out for you, so that you know how you're judging things when you are exposed to them. And then after that, he goes into the second part, which is the making of faith, and in that he talks about. The Quran, the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sunnah talks about the companions, talks about the city of the Prophet Sallallahu and then the last part, and then the way of the world. And then the last part of the book is um, the fruits of faith. So when you apply this religion properly and adopt it and take it wholeheartedly, what does it mean? How does it impact you? How does it manifest itself in the world? Um, and so I tell people to read this book first, and if they have it in them, to also read Ali Razad Begovic's Islam Between East and West. Read those two books, that kind of sets the stage. Then pick up a Quran translation, I recommend M.A.S. Abdul Halim's. But along with that, also listen to the recitation of the Quran, even if they don't understand it. Because as uh, Charles Guy Eden says, it's not about just the language, it's also, the, it's not what's contained, it's not about the content, it's the container as well. And the Qur'an is transmitted in a particular fashion. You don't just read the Qur'an in Arabic, you recite it. And there are rules for recitation. There is tajweed, there is ways of doing it. And you have to sit with a teacher to be able to recite it properly. Well, there is a secret in the tajweed. There is a secret in the tartil of the Qur'an that can only be attained or uh, perceived when you hear it properly. So even if you don't intellectually understand the Qur'an in Arabic, your soul is going to understand what is being said. Subhanallah. Your being is going to be impacted by the tajweed. And so I tell people, read the Quran in English so that you understand what's being said to some degree, but listen to it also in Arabic so that you feel the impact of it because you will feel it even if you don't understand Arabic. But only do these two things after you read Islam and the, and the Destiny of Man because that sets the stage. The Quran is not a linear book. Um, if you are if you come from a Western context and you're used to a particular order of how chapters should unfold and how stories should unfold and things, it will come across as incoherent. There are things that are missing for you. Uh, there is a lot of context that is not there. The Quran itself was revealed over a 23-year period. So even Arabs had to go through a gradual process of being exposed to the Quran. 
And you need to have that context as a non-Muslim, non-Westerner person to um, understand what's being said. So if you just pick up the Quran by yourself, yeah, you'll find stories on YouTube of individuals who read the Quran and they felt impactful and they converted. That is not the norm. The general rule is that people will find it incoherent. Um, they will not finish it. Most of them don't even get halfway through it and they just drop it because they don't get what's going on. Um, and so I tell him, read this book first because he actually sets the stage and he tells him how to read the Quran itself, how to approach it, what to expect out of it. That, that's a fantastic um, analysis, what you just did, and something that a lot of Muslims don't want to come to terms with. We've all been kind of, uh, if, if, like I repeat it, um, some people can even say that it's heresy, you know, that, um, you know, how could you say that um, it, the Quran wouldn't be appealing to a Western audience? It should be, it, you know, its message is eternal and it's appealing to everyone and it's, it's it speaks to our innate uh, um, uh, characteristics of our soul. And I, and I think, I think what, what, what you're also talking about is something uh, related to the truth, uh, in, in in terms of that quote that you just, I was just gonna talked it, about, yeah. right? And something that we've been talking about through our throughout our podcast, your podcast, mm -hmm. um, we've been talking about postmodernism. We've been talking about all these different types of philosophies, and uh, one of the things that myself and Sheikh Ahmed learned when we were first getting into the religion, we were learning about, you know, um, uh, how to understand the reality. Okay, so we were using different terms back then, but we're re really just talking about the truth and how to understand the world around us. Um, and and we, we talked touched on this uh, quite a bit on our episode with you in, regarding consciousness, and that's what probably the most downloaded episode the Mad One Looks ever made. So if <laughs> you uh, have a chance, make sure you listen to that episode if you haven't already before this episode because it's, it really drives... Um, it'll probably uh, make a lot more sense to you. Um, but in terms of building the the initial understandings of how man or humans being, uh, conscious human beings, how does a consciousness develop initially, right? When we first try to look at... Um, well, how did our thoughts come together and how did we start making um, ideas and those ideas became um, larger understandings about things um, around us? Let, let's let's kind of walk through the, these steps and, and in terms of understanding what consciousness is and why it's such a difficult um, thing that scientists can, can't can explain. What, they, they have very difficult time explaining why um uh, consciousness cannot be duplicated, right? Um, sh sh uh, do you do you have any um, uh, tools that can probably help us bring um, bring some of these ideas together so that we can understand uh, we can understand ourselves a lot better? There's a problem with um, the, the the modern world assumes that the only method of inquiry that is valid to attain knowledge is the scientific method. And the scientific method, by its very nature, is uh, a reductive process. Um, you, you, can't, you can't approach anything scientifically unless you break it into its components, and then you study each component on its own, and then you make an induction out of these components to a larger scale. If you reflect on the... Um, the assumptions of that, I mean, uh, what is the foundational premise of Islam? It's Tawheed. It's unity. It's divine unity. It's La ilaha illallah. And he is the only, he's the creator of everything that is in existence. And what we see are just multiplicities um, of that, um, of manifestations of the attributes that are coming from the one. Scientific method, on the other hand, assumes multiplicity as the start. And then it induces it to a larger scale. There's a way to look at it. It's almost like a... Um, uh, can you explain what that means, yeah, multiplicity? I was just say, when you say multiplicity, do you mean uh, uh, multiple deities? Do you mean multiple ideas? In your yes, multiple multiple things. Multiple things in existence. I mean, if you uh, look at somebody like Ibn Arabi, Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi, when he talks about Wahdat um, al-Wujud, which people have some people have misunderstood it to think that he's talking about pantheism, which is far from what he was talking about. Wahdat al-wujud or unity of existence 
um, it's that the only thing that is self-sustaining, self-sufficient in his existence is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything else is contingent upon his existence. And everything you see in the world are manifestations of divine attributes. One of the attributes is al-khaliq, the other one is al-bari, al-musawwir. Whenever you see things happening in the world, they're always manifestations of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They appear to you to be happening in multiples. They're, they're different things. But in reality, they're actually one. If you see beyond, it's like شَغَلَتْنَا الْأَدِلَّ عَنَ الْمَدْلُولِ the, the, uh, the evidences, the multiple lines of evidence have preoccupied our minds to the degree that we've become forgetful over what they're pointing to. Uh, like the Buddhist saying that we became confused and looked at the finger, confused the finger for the moon, finger pointing at the moon for the moon itself. Mm. So everything you see in the world is just a divine manifestation of the multiple of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is one. The scientific method, on the other hand, assumes that you can understand the world not as one, but as multiples. That I can take uh, any element of the in the world, divide it into its component parts, study these component parts, which is the, the Achilles heel of the scientific method, is that it breaks everything into components. And then assumes, and it's a logical fallacy, it, assume, it assumes that by, by studying the components, I can understand the whole. So I can take a, a human being, consciousness for example, I can look at, we assume ahead of time, we don't even know this for sure by the way, we just assume it, that it's got to do something to do with the brain. Because that's where the, the neur most of the neurons seem to be, that's where a lot of uh, activities take place for uh, cognition and perception and whatnot. Um, that's the end uh, point for all of these things. So we study the brain and then we break the brain into components. We break it into regions and then from regions into different neurons and there are different types of neurons and different types of other cells in the nervous system. And by studying these cells and studying their activity, I can then induce from that an understanding about the whole. In a sense, it's kind of idolatry. It's a type of idolatry. It's a type of polytheism because you're looking at the world as multiples. That's what polytheistic, like Hinduism is what, 300 million gods or whatever? That's kind of how you're looking at the world from a scientific perspective. It's all these multiples, and I'm going to look at the attributes of these multiples and then induce from it some sort of understanding about the whole. And every time you see scientists coming up with some discovery about, oh, this thing is related to that because they share this much percentage of the genome or whatever, because they don't come from a position of Tawheed, they actually attribute it to relations between each thing in this world, as opposed to the Creator is one, and all of these are signs pointing to the one, as opposed to them pointing to each other as gods in their own right. Mm. Um, so the, 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 the problem with the modern world is that the scientific method is the only way that I can achieve, um, and, and I'm talking scientific in the sense that the empirical study of material things in existence that we are able to perceive whether through our five senses or through our technological advancements. This is the only way for us to understand something like if we have a question about consciousness. Well, the problem with consciousness is that you're using consciousness to study consciousness. There is nothing in science that does that except when it comes to consciousness and that's why they call it the heart problem. Um, you have to become greater than the thing that you're studying. The, the tools of measurement that you use to study anything have to encompass that thing that you're measuring. You have to transcend above it in some degree so that you become an objective observer and study it at, the, at, a, great, at a, a transcendent level so that you can make conclusions about it. The problem with consciousness is that, number one, you're conscious, so you, have to, you can't transcend your own consciousness in that sense. And secondly... Because they recognize that problem and they want to become objective, they give you a different definition of consciousness. And consciousness no longer becomes about awareness of oneself and one's thought, this third degree of higher awareness of your existence and your own being. No, consciousness now becomes the study of attention, the study of uh, sensory perception, the study of cognition. Because that's the only proper it's, it, approach it, to something, right? And I think What's that's that? I think it's an improper approach to something that what, what I'm understanding from you is an improper yeah. approach to consciousness, which makes it very difficult to decipher what's truth at the end. Right. Well, it's redefining. It's like understanding you can't explain something. So then redefining the boundaries. Exactly. To like try it's, to like make sense of it. Exactly. So I, oh, I, they I understand very well. They understand this very well, but they are limited by the method of inquiry. The method of inquiry does not allow you to study it and answer the question that you really want to know. 
I'm not interested in attention that like you can show me an image on a screen and then tell me and then make it disappear in two seconds and then show it again to, and ask me to tell you what's different about it. That's not consciousness. That's just attention. Okay. So, um, so, so what is consciousness? It's, that's something that I'm trying to understand. Um, when, and uh, I think a lot of people are trying to understand what consciousness is, is exactly when we as children are, are born, we're just sucking in information through our senses, right? Our five senses, mm -hmm. where we're we're just like a, a black hole, just sucking in everything, right? And um, we're making associations, right, with all this information. We're trying to put together uh, links based on cause and effect mm -hmm. um, with all this information that's kind of been sucked into our mind, and and eventually we start making th sense of things like. Um, you know, um, you know, drinking milk is nu uh, nutrition. We um, we see babies. You know, they get really happy when they're uh, drinking a bottle of milk. They understand that that this thing is going to make them satisfied on a That's biological not level. Though. But That's not consciousness, right? Right, because animals also have that too. Exactly. Right. Consciousness is beyond that. Consciousness is your awareness of your mortality. Oh, because there is a moment that each one of us experience in our lives where we yes. stand in front of the mirror and you, you kind of go like, whoa, yeah. like, I'm, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm somebody who exists. And I, is, I think for is, me, it was like when I was like 10, I was pretty dumb. So just, it took me a while, yeah, but maybe language. Sheikh I mean, Amir understood Quran. it when he was five. <laughs> yeah, use Quranic language. I mean, in the Quran, what is, what is ghafla? It's the opposite of consciousness. Yeah, it's forgetfulness. It's forgetfulness. It's, it's uh, being in a state of ghafla. It's yeah. being in a state of heedlessness. It's in a state of forgetfulness. It's a state of lack of awareness. You know, I was just going to mention that. About your, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just going about your life in a state of um, lack of awareness. But lack of awareness of what? What is Allah talking about here? Hmm. Yeah. So this is about... Consciousness from an Islamic perspective, yeah. it's number one, awareness of your mortality. What one and what yeah. One thing I, I usually one, understand, sorry to cut yeah, you off, is exactly. when I try when I uh try to explain consciousness to some of my students, uh one thing if we break break it down on a very molecular level, we have to, to, to understand consciousness, the human being needs a focal point, a single focal point, right? If you have mm. multiple focal points that becomes very confusing and then again it's a wrong approach, I I believe is you have to have a single focal point. And not only all over the Qur'an, but a beautiful elementary hadith that Rasulullah when the waft al-Yaman came to Rasulullah you know, I'm paraphrasing the hadith, ma aslu had shay, or something to that extent. You know, what what are the origins of all this? And Rasulullah he said, kan Allah wa lam yakun ma'ahu shay. There was mm. only Allah and there was nothing with him. When yeah. he's talking about before the world was created, everything, there was only Allah. And one of the narration says there was only Allah and there was just darkness, right? So mm -hmm. what that does is the hadith gives even children such a focal point to understand that Allah was first and he was always there. It was out of his own wisdom of creation after that, right? Yeah. Even though Allah yeah. was always the creator before even creating, Be right? Before even time. Yeah, before even time, which is a creation. Right. We're bound by time, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created time is a creation for us. But now we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we know that there was only Allah and there was nothing else before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now it makes us, it, it makes our the focal point, even of our brain, easy to come to the truth, to know where truth actually comes from, right? It's as mm -hmm. if the hadith just, this is why this the hadith are actually genius, right? Is that yeah. it, it, it obliterated everything. There's nothing in existence except for Allah. So now there's no confusion. What happens when you're on the street or on the road when you're driving? There's too many things around you, so there's too many distractions. All of that's alleviated from us, right? And there's only Allah. Yeah. And from then on, we can build our consciousness, right? Because we have a focal point. If we, don't ha if we have multiple points to focus on, then we don't, we're not going to come to the truth, right? And it, exactly. we have to understand Allah before everything if we want to understand the truth. And I think that kind of builds the paradigm properly, right? There's only one, and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and everything mm. that comes from him is true. And that's why when he was explaining that quote, I remember Sim, he was very, even multiple podcasts that we had, I think that quote from, what did you say his name was? Uh, 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 Guy Eden? Guy Louis, Eden yes. Louis Foucault? What? No. <laughs> Guy, Guy Eaton, yes. <laughs> Louis Foucault is the founder of Guy Eaton. Guy Eaton, yes. Yeah. He, and 
the, it, that's a summarization, Sim, of what you've been trying to say to many of the guests also, is that, listen, Islam is about truth. It doesn't matter what time you're living in. It doesn't matter if you're going to aim and to, to attain the truth. Nothing else really matters. Yeah, you have to be nice uh, if you disagree with somebody, but regardless, the truth is the truth. Right? No, but it, you have to be a truth it's something, seeker. and we were talking about this uh, before the podcast, uh, something that we picked up from Firas Sahabi's uh, appearance on Joe Rogan's episode. He was, he was show too. Yeah, so a, any <laughs> listeners uh, out there who... I don't want to give who, Joe Rogan all this credit. <laughs> no, I, I, well, let's give Firas yeah. the credit because yeah. I, I know he's um, uh, he's a practicing Muslim and he's... Uh, so... Uh, if anyone wants to go check it out, uh, listen to last hour where he really talks about this. But he's talking about science's limitation on the human perspective that we are bound, we are restricted to the understanding of the reality through the first person, and we cannot understand the reality from a third person perspective. So let, let me make it more easier to understand. Imagine a lot of people play Ma- Minecraft. I, I don't think Shaham or, or Mahin plays Minecraft, but I don't um, mind Minecraft is a game where you, you understand all these, the, the world around you is completely blocks, right? And if you explore the world, you're continuously building things with these blocks. But if you look at it from a third person perspective, there might be triangles and things like that that you are completely unaware of that exist in this world. So th- this is what we're talking about. When you're looking at science, you're really ex- you're really restricted to the first person perspective in the universe. But is with Islam, it is the only third person truth that exists mm. in the world. If you think about mm. it, th- there's really no truth out there that we really understand from a third person perspective. See what you're so okay with that being said though i'd like to be i you know we're operating from a muslim perspective to start right and then we're trying and we have like we're already in the islam box but yeah. like how, how do we get there if you're not in the islam box you mean you're a muslim you're, you're not, not muslim, muslim. oh you're not muslim or you're whatever you're, you're some you're just random kafir kid running around a <laughs> drive <laughs> <laughs> You just gave away our address. That's why I said that it starts off with this recognition of your mortality. Consciousness cannot be awakened until you – because you have a lot of people that are walking around. They appear conscious, but they're not. And only when they begin to to contemplate on their own mortality, that is the path towards actually becoming aware and conscious of your own existence being contingent. And by implication from that, you recognize the absolute existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you can become conscious. But that's how you start. You start off with just first reflecting on... Because it, living without God is absurd. It's an absurdity. If you think about the nature of existence without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do you do? You get up in the morning, you take a bath, take a shower, whatever. You go to work, you have breakfast, you go to work, or you go to school, you study, you struggle. You do, you're a social activist, you're a social justice warrior type of person. You go and march and do all of these things. For what? If there is nothing beyond this, if there is nothing after death, and all that's going to happen is you're just going to be dirt in the earth, what's the point? What's the point of all the degrees that you get? What's the point of this podcast? Hmm. I think they would say, though, yeah, but there's no point. But when people say that, well, that's the whole point. The, like the we have a limited framework of sixty years, and we gotta make everything work in that sixty years because there's Why nothing struggle? after. Why struggle if it's only sixty years? Why struggle? I think it's about like I heard one guy say Being it's about a good legacy. Person. You want to be a or good it's about person. legacy. It's all about like the thing we legacy we, for what legacy for our children and our grandchildren and why things. you'll be forgotten in two generations. No, I, I think I know what he's the approach he's taking is people just want to say you know we want you, you know you want to be a good person. Well. The the Republican down south who's, you know, bathing his bullets in uh, swine blood to shoot Muslims, he thinks he's doing something good too, right? So there has yeah, to be a criterion for what's good and what's wrong, right? There has exactly. to be a criterion. There is, there is no point to any of this. I mean, if you look at Nietzsche's, why did Nietzsche lose his mind towards the end of his life? Is because he just recognized when he, his point in, the, in his book, The Gay Science, where he wrote his aphorisms. Um, is that where he, he, where he declared God is dead? 
Yeah, that's where he said God is dead. And um, he said when God is dead, then we have to become gods ourselves. Because there is no longer an absolute transcendent source of morality, of existence, of meaning, of any of that stuff. And so what's the point? The, 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 the end game is what's the point? Like it, that's the problem with consciousness is that once you start to become aware of your mortality, there are two paths that you will go with. Either you will go through the path of Nietzsche, which is just existence itself is absurd and there is no meaning to it. And let's just maximize pleasure while we're here. And who's to define what pleasure is? I mean, if you want to talk about postmodernism, postmodernism is a direct byproduct of an atheistic worldview. Because if you don't have an absolute trans transcendent source of morality, and all you need to do is just maximize pleasure and minimize pain for yourself, well, who's get, who gets to define what pleasure is? It's the powerful who will get to define what's pleasurable. And it becomes a power game. Right. So those in power will, will coerce others to do what they think is right. That's exactly um, and so that's the path that you take. That's or, exactly postmodernism right there. Yeah, that's it's just a byproduct of atheism. Or you decide that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent and you recognize that and then that's your source of morality and that's your source of truth. And then it no longer becomes a power game in that sense that you coerce people to doing things because of what you find pleasurable. Rather it becomes because of what is true and what is just. And and as far, as long as we're talking about our mortality, and you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, uh, you know, makes it so simple and easy for us by starting off by telling us who our father is, and what his father was made of, and generations after that procreation, what our essence and what we're actually made of, not only physically, but then you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us that in in insana khuliqa halua that he's created in a very hasty mm -hmm. manner allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually putting the layers down of our consciousness and our mortality in such an elementary fashion where truth becomes very easy right truth becomes mm -hmm. very very uh it's like you have no other way to believe it you know there's, there's no other way and it yeah. seems as you know when you get a false sense of understanding what your consciousness is that's where the mental gymnastics begins and that's where you go off the rails and your own consciousness becomes your source of your misery, right? And it becomes your source of destruction. Yep. Yes, yes. Right? It can, it can but, either be your best friend or it can become your enemy. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just I look at this at these questions of consciousness. I used to be really, like, I used to dig deep into it and have multiple books that I went through and listened to numerous lectures on the subject and stuff. And... Now I just find it kind of boring, to be honest, because the number one, the definition of the consciousness, is the, the assumption, the approach to knowledge is limited. You right. can only attain knowledge through the scientific methodology, which is the study of empirical phenomena. And then because of that, they've limited the definition itself of consciousness. And so they're no longer talking about real consciousness, what people are actually talking about when they're talking about consciousness. They're just talking about things that, only, that science can only study which is now you're looking at attention, perception, sensory deprivation, how does that impact your perception of the world, things like that. Yeah. Um, and so it's no longer, it's, it's, it leaves you wanting. There is no answer to what you're actually seeking. And because they, they have um, uh, dismissed the role of revelation, um, irrationally, by the way, um, they just say that it's, it's, it's not a valid form of knowledge, um, so they go with their incoherent methodology, and so you, you've, they've limited the uh, the scope of knowledge for people, and so you have the multiple people writing books and things, and that's really how this um, modern academia functions. The way modern academia functions is by finding loopholes in somebody else's explanations and write your own papers and write your books, and, and that's how you make yourself a name. It's not about truth. And it alleviates all responsibility. What happens in this process is that if there is no truth, there is no responsibility, right? Well, all you're exactly. doing is deconstructing yeah. stuff but not reconstructing anything. Exactly. But at the end, nobody wants responsibility. If they answer that question properly, that there is one truth, there's one Allah, and everything has to come from Him, then that's responsibility, mm -hmm. right? Then there's you have yep. to change. There's a, a radical, a rapid, I want to say. Well, oh, okay, right. let's, let's, play, devil's ad, let's play devil's advocate. Let's say you're an atheist, and then you come to the conclusion that Allah exists. But now it's like, okay, so God exists. But then now what? Now I got to find like, okay, does God, because a lot of people will say, okay, 
for their for their truth, there's like if you tell them, well, I believe God exists, I'm like, what do you think about Islam? It's like, yeah, I'm not really into organized religion. And I usually say, well, so are you into disorganized religion? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but the point is, like, um, you know, that but you know, they have to. Get, that's another leap, right? That you gotta like. Well, I get had them somebody. To. I actually had a conversation with somebody in, uh, a couple weeks back. Uh, she's an atheist, mm-hmm. and we had a good like. I think it was an hour and a half of chatting after this panel that I was in, and um, at the end of the con- discussion, she became an agnostic. She acknowledged that she's not really an atheist because I just pushed her with her with the line of questioning, and she acknowledged at the end that you know you're you're right. I can't really say for certain. Okay, then don't call yourself an atheist. If you can't be certain about it, call yourself an agnostic. Okay, oh sure, I'll accept that. All right. So why are you here? I mean, you came all the way to this gathering. You sat down. You listened to the talk. You listened to our panels. Um, why are you here? Oh, I just want to learn. Okay, so are you interested? Are you open to changing if you learn something that is true? That you become convinced for your own sake that this is the truth. Are you open to, to it? And she said yes. I was like, all right, if you're open to it, I'm going to give you some books to read. So I recommended to her Islam and the Destiny of Man, Islam Between East and West, you know, pick up Ms. Abdul Hayim's translation, listen to the Quran being recited. She said, listen to it, take your time, just read the books, read, go through that. And then if after all of that, if you have any other questions, come back to me and then I'll answer them too. At the end of the day, It is not upon us to guide people. Our task in this world is to deliver the message. And so I'm perfectly content just, you know, do it. So I just do that. That's my role. That's, that's the task that I was imparted with. So I, I deliver all the information, I answer all the questions, and then I say, and, and then I tell them, at the end of the day, if you're interested in finding truth, water does not flow from lower uh, ground to higher ground. Water flows only from higher elevations to lower elevations. So if, you want to, if you're thirsty for truth and you want to drink it, you have to humble yourself. Don't come at this with assumptions and presuppositions that you got everything figured out. Be open to it. And so here's the information, here's the, and then, so I try to turn people's attention, I try to raise their awareness and their consciousness with regards to their assumptions that they have and their biases and prejudices so that they're aware of them because people will behave with their biases without knowing so until it's pointed out to them and it's like, oh, wait a minute, I shouldn't do that. Most people are good in that sense. They don't want to be behaving with biases that will deprive them from truth. So I turn their attention to their biases. I give them the information. I set them, uh, set them on the path that I think is proper. And then I open my lines of communication. If you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to come along. But at no point do I assume or do I uh, uh, push anything upon them that they don't want to be pushed on. I'm not expecting them to convert um, because I, I, that's not my role. Guidance is for Allah. You know, uh, you mentioned um, something about the absurdity of, you know, uh, trying to delve into consciousness and all these things. And I, I, I remember thinking like, yes, I had that same moment too, where, you know, reading the books of philosophy and things like that, where like, where is this headed? You know, you're kind of running around in circles. But I, I think that there's a lot of, Young Muslims there around in in the West who are just getting into this stuff, right? And they're trying to get their minds around understanding concepts like God is dead. Like, what what does that mean? That took I, me forever I, I to even understand. Yeah, like, in, I, the older I get and the more I have been doing this, um, the more I'm realizing something. Um, we focus so much on the intellectual um, back and forth right. with a lot of these subjects. And we forget that an essential element of the Islamic tradition of, of experience of truth involves practice. Imam al-Ghazali in his uh, Deliverance from Error, al munqid bin al-Dalal, brilliantly outlined biography of his spiritual journey. You know, he read for the philosophers, he read for the esoterics, he read for the, uh, the, so, the, the, the sophists, he read for all of these people. And he mastered their methodologies and he wrote books in their own schools that were better than their own scholars to the degree that they, he was attested for by them. So we, he came up with arguments that we didn't even come up with. So he was brilliant in that sense, but he was dissatisfied. He found himself 
still wanting to attain certainty. I still want to know that I'm certain in my truth in this religion. He's still a Muslim. He believes, but he's he's looking for. It's almost like Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, when he asked Allah subhanahu wa taala, "Qala Rabbi arini kafa tuhi al mauta." Qala awalam tuumin. Qala bala, walakin li yatmin qalbi. I I believe, O oh Allah, and this is Khalilullah. He believes, but he still wants to gain that additional certainty. So Allah showed him through experience. Cut up these birds, spread them across the mountains, and then call them to you. They will come hastily. They will come quickly to you. So in this religion, I mean, if you look at it, um, we are surrounded with technology left, right, and center. Um, I asked, I did a, I was given the blessing of giving the khutbah yesterday at the mosque here, and um I just posed a question to people because we're a week now after and there was the, the usual drama with moon sighting and whatnot. So I just asked the crowd, I said, look, look just to, I'm not going to advocate for calculations or moon sighting or whatever. I just want you to reflect on the implications of a decision that you make with regards to how you conduct your act of worship. Let's reflect on prayer, for example. If I were to ask everybody in this congregation, how many of you have actually witnessed the break of dawn? Literally, like the actual break, when you see that long, thin line, white line in the horizon of the sun coming up, where it indicates for you that now Fajr, this is the time of Fajr, which is the break of dawn. How many of you have actually witnessed it? And I made a, a, an assertion that 98% of you will say none of you have actually gone out and seen that. Okay, if you haven't seen that, can you honestly be truthful when you say you understand when Allah says, Wal Fajr, Wal Ayalin Ashr? Do you understand the significance of that oath that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by? How many of you have seen this, the light of the sun as it comes up, as it starts to uh, dissipate across and uh, starts to cover the sky? And then you can see even up above you that half of the sky is light and half of it is dark. And as the sun is setting, the same thing. So if you haven't seen that and you haven't witnessed it, can you really say that you understand what وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى what that actually means. Have you seen it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the whole Quran is pointing to natural phenomena left, right, and center all over the place and linked our acts of worship to these, to these phenomena showing us that if you want to uh, do your prayer أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى رَبِّكَ كَيْفَ مَدَّ الظِّلِّ وَلَوْ شَاءَ لَجَعَلَهُ سَاكِنًا وَجَعَلْنَا الشَّمْسَ عَلَيْهِ دَلِيلًا ثُمَّ قَبَضْنَهُ إِلَيْنَا قَبْضًا يَسِيرًا Surah Al-Furqan So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tells you in Surah Al-Furqan Do you not see how he extends the shadow? And had he wanted, he would have made the shadow um, still and he would have made the sun itself be the indicator for the shadow as opposed to how it is right now. Okay, Dhuhr time, there's a way to know it. How many of you can actually tell if a magnetic wave, a magnetic storm comes from the sun right now and shuts down all of this technology. How many Muslims are all going to be able to, on their own, determine when Dhuhr and Asr time enters? All of us are relying on all of these created things, these made up stuff through Adhan apps that we have downloaded on our laptops and computers and iPhones. Um, Maghrib time enters, how many of you have actually seen the sun set? So that you can see the sign of Allah. Same thing with the Hilal, you know, the crescent. You want to rely on calculations? MashaAllah, more power to you. But I need you to know that when you decide that, when you make that decision, you actively kill a sunnah. He, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, used to go and sight the new moon, which in Arabic called Hilal, from Arabic Ahalla, which means it appears, thus indicating from the Arabic itself that it's something that you have to have an active relationship with. And then he used to see it and then he would make a dua. Allahumma hillu alayna bil yumni wal iman wal sinu wal islam. And then he would turn to the moon and he would say, Rabbi wa rabbuk Allah. He would talk to the moon. Allah. Why? Allah. Because he, the moon itself is making tasbih. It's a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam would speak to the moon. So when you say, I'm just going to go with the calculations, you're now killing a sunnah. You're abandoning a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Know that that is the implication of your decision. I'm not saying wrong or right. I'm just wanting you to understand that. So when you have all of these things being abandoned, you don't know how to, the link between your acts of worship and the natural phenomena. I mean, even ulama in the Quran, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quranic term for ulama does not refer to um, uh, scholars of the religion. 
ولو ردوه الى الى الله ورسوله واولي الامر منهم لعلمه الذين يستنبطونه so that's اولي الامر is a reference to the scholars of the religion uh, فاسالوا اهل الذكر ان كنتم لا تعلمون ask the people of remembrance if you don't know these are the scholars of the religion but what about علماء who are the علماء in the Quran Allah says in Surah Fatir ألم ترى أن الله أنزل من السماء ماء فأخرجنا به ثمرات مختلفة ألوانها Do you not see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has descended from the heavens water and then he brought fruits and plants different colors ومن الجبال جدد بيض وحم مختلف ألوانها وغرابي بسود and from the mountains you have white and red and different colors of hues of black ومن الناس والدواب والأنعام of people of animals of cattle Different, مختلف ألوانه كذلك different colors as well. إنما يخشى الله من عباده العلماء. إن الله عزيز غفور. Truly, the only people who really fear Allah subhanahu wa taala certainly are the ulama. So Allah is refer is listing all of these natural phenomena and then He's calling people who understand these things the ulama. سورة العنكبوت مثل الذين اتخذوا من دون الله أولياء كمثل العنكبوت اتخذت بيته وإن أوهن البيوت لبيت العنكبوت لو كانوا يعلمون the example of the house of the of those who take uh, awliya, take uh, supporters, helpers, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like the, the spider. When it takes a house, it is the weakest of houses. And these are the examples, the analogies we give to people, we strike for people, and the only ones who truly understand it are al-alimun, those who have knowledge. So you want to talk about attaining certainty, consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to go out there and look at the creation of Allah. You cannot know Allah. As Allah says in Surah Al-Imam, لَا تُدْرِكُ الْأَبْصَارِ وَهُوْ يُدْرِكُ الْأَبْصَارِ no, Sights cannot get at him, cannot reach him, but he reaches all sights. You have to go out and actually see the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you want to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوْ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ there is nothing like unto him. You cannot know Allah directly, but you can know him through his creation. And he's pointing you out throughout all the Quran. So how can you recite the Quran even during Ramadan? MashaAllah, people do these khatam and all of these things. I wonder how many of us really experience the impact of the Quran truly and understand it. No matter how much tafsir you, re tafsir you read, how do you really experience it when you have not experienced the things that Allah is talking about? Allah is listing all of these things. I've done this, I've created this, I've made this, I've, I've put this out for you, I've done this, this and that. And you've not seen any of them. You're but, reading it. It's all abstract to you. Even if, I can you're add on to that, even if I could add on to that, the simplicity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about our very creation in the different phases, it's so easy mm -hmm. that he just wants us to reflect on just our being itself. Right? Yep. Within yeah. you is a greatest sign of Allah, don't you see? Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually telling us you don't even have to look to the celestial bodies you don't have to look at anything no. look at yourself and just think about how that happens right how do you have eyesight right you know so and it's and, it's it's truly amazing just looking at yourself i mean every day i'm subhanallah i just I, when you reflect when you try to account for the blessings of allah you cannot attack, make, make measure of it the fact that you're able to sit without falling off the chair or stand and walk, and eat, and process the food in your body, and go to the gym if you go to the gym, or study, or write, all of these things, look at things, the colors, the hues, the things that you can perceive, I mean, the, the hearing that you have, the abilities that you have, all of these things, that they're not out of your own accord. You would be nothing without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah is granting you. Just reflecting on your own existence, like Shaykh Amr said, you write, like, that should just put you in a state of awe that should render you almost speechless yeah. and paralyzed from just wonder. And this is what I tell people. I say, look, man, whether you're Muslim, you're unmuslim, you're atheist, whatever the case is, when you see a baby, especially if it's your own, why are you in such amazement every time they make a progression? Why do you look at them mm. and like words cannot describe when you look at your child, especially that age, you know, between like, up until like one years old, up until 14, 15, 16 months, there's certain things that a child does where it's actually magical, but there's no real conscious way that you can actually describe it, right? There's nothing, mm -hmm. and we see that on a regular basis. Everybody sees it. But 
Yeah. And only the human being goes through these stages to the degree that we do, and we progress through these different yes, phases. You're right. Animals, animals just let their what is it? Few hours. They get up and then they suckle at the, uh, yep. at, the at their mother, and then they go and graze. Yep. And then they become independent after a certain age, right? And they just let them go, and yep. they never even think about them, right? But exactly. I think there's something here, and there's a reason why I mentioned that, is that everyone sees this. Everyone sees the progression of their children if they do have children. Or even if they have pets, you know, you can fall in love with your pets. It's totally cool because animals are amazing too. But the consciousness that they have and the lens of what they're looking at that person, there is a disconnect that occurs now, right? Which mm -hmm. is where I think where people in, in, in talking about, you know, even philosophies and their confusion and their aqidah and their belief, they look at this being and for them, they know it's too good to be true, but there's a philosophy that, that kind of just kicks in and it makes them not believe the origins of how this beauty came about and how, the, how, how this creation came about. And the only dilemma and the only benefit that, and it's not even a benefit, I'm being, you know, kind of condescending here. But when mm. you're talking to people and they're trying to convince you that there is no creator, the only thing that they actually bring to the table is doubts and mental gymnastics. That's why I very much despise that discourse. Sometimes you have to have it, but Sometimes, you know, you know, even when you're discussing with atheists or people that are very affected by atheism, the only thing that they're bringing to the table is doubts, and then they back up and feel like they've accomplished something huge. But in actuality, they didn't bring any material. They didn't bring any truth. They just made you doubt, and they find that as a huge accomplishment. And then they start talking about how intellectual this way of thinking is, that you just question everything. And when you question even, everything... You're right. Even the doubt that they... Um, so if you look at... Descartes' epistemology of all. So he brought something new that was like he was a mubtada <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> he was a big mubtada. His bid'ah was people used to have a kind of intuitive truths, like just accept it as it is. And he would come in and he'd say, and his analogy was interesting. He said, um, if I tell you that there's here's the box of apples and some of them are rotten, what will you do to find out the, the ones that are not rotten? He said, you will have to empty the box completely, investigate each apple. And then keep the ones that are good and throw the ones that are rotten away. Hmm. And he thinks, and that's his method. He's like, everything has to be doubted as a, a priori. To begin with, doubt everything. Don't believe anything you hear until you test it out and figure out and make sure that it's... So there's some validity to that. But there, the question that poses There's some validity, then, but even that example, I'm sorry. I, I, for a human to, 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 to make, uh, to use that as an example to find truth I feel is very flawed is because a human yes. by default, even as a child, the re one of the main reasons why we believe, you know, why, why we love our mothers and our parents at such a young age is because we trust them, right? Our lives mm -hmm. are built on trust, not on doubt. As a child, exactly. everything you're being taught and even with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us the story of Adam alayhi salam, right? Teaching Adam alayhi salam the name of everything is to teach us that Adam alayhi salam trusted everything that Allah taught mm -hmm. him, right? But when shaitan mm -hmm. came and deceived him, he was not used to trickery, right? So he was actually tricked yes. into something. He didn't even know the concept of trickery. So shaitan tells yeah. him what? No, this is only if you two want to be angels, then that's why Allah was saying not to approach the tree. But that was because he wasn't even used to the concept of trickery, which why he was tricked into it, right? And, mm -hmm. and and so us by human beings, by default, are trust beings that trust others, right? Yes. And, I mean, but, I'll tell you a story. It's uh, My friend was, they made fun of me for this. I'm like, I'll tell you the story. So a friend of mine had his his wife gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. And uh, we were in Canada at the time. And so he tells me, it's like, mashallah, and you know what? And so he, two of my friends together. And so he says, you know what? And the kid, she's he's from Saudi Arabia. So he's like, my daughter now has both a Canadian and, an, a, US, and a U.S. citizenship. I'm like, mashallah, <laughs> how did that happen? And he's like, yeah, she was born here in Canada, but the nurse was American. And so she got both a Canadian and American citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you, wallahi. <laughs> Initially, I had like a good five seconds. I'm like, mashallah, I didn't know that they could do that. That's amazing. <laughs> so they both look at me. I was like, are you serious? I'm like, is that, that didn't happen? It's like, so they, they laugh at me. It's like, ah, no, we're just kidding. It's, of course that doesn't happen. I'm like, that says something about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, you trusted them, dude. You know, I and, trusted you. I didn't think you would lie to me. Exactly. And you <laughs> exactly. Exa that's exactly my point. 
which is why you yeah. have to learn not to get duped in the streets, right? You have yeah, to pick yeah, up yeah. that. You when you say, "Oh, somebody's street smart," what does that mean? Oh, you know, he's lived life, so now he's not going to fall into traps that are potentially there because he's used to trusting everybody as default, right? Which is why that yeah. example. I know that's a that's a. I know that's probably not what you meant by that example, but I was just thinking out loudly that deconstructing type of idea where you know taking the apples out of the baskets and doubting everything yeah that itself yeah. is not human that itself is not our our mortality is is to, is to doubt everything we're actually beings that depend on others to trust to, to build ourselves yeah. and to progress right well and, not just that it's like the question that came to my mind when i read that i was like renee man like what is the criteria that you're using to judge what is rotten mm, you're right you're already making assumptions about truth and you're already trusting in something yeah, and you're just right. moving the buck somewhere and just uh, for your own convenience. You didn't even plagiarize Ghazali properly. <laughs> plagiarize him properly. I like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, right. and, you know, uh, the book, I'm glad we're talking about this topic, man. Al-Iqtisadu al-I'tiqad of Imam al-Ghazali. Yeah. You know, in the introduction, he brings up four types of people, right? Four types of iman. Yes. And the first person that he talks about is there's those people who believe in Allah. And they fully submit to Allah. And they're very content with their iman. And they don't need the science. He's talking about philosophy, right? And he's like, they don't need this because now you're just going to disrupt them because they already have something pure. And now you're giving them something to cause turmoil that shouldn't be there in the first place. Exactly. Right? And that's what that does is this mental gymnastics. This is what Imam Ghazali very much went through, right? And because he was very content with his iman. But going and delving into philosophy, what it did to him was, right? What it did to him was it, it, it caused and it had, there was a stir up that wasn't supposed to occur, which is why at the end, after he writes the book, he says, I've come to the full conviction that this is only for a select elite group of people to study. The ummah has no business going through any of this stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then people will tell you that's elitist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's there's, there's reality to that, man, because you're, there, it's not even about truth and not truth. It's about that consciousness, which is so powerful. The intellect of the human being is so powerful. It will develop a story to make you doubt something when you're actually when you actually never doubted in the first place. Exactly. Right. And that's, and that's what, why, I, like, I tell people, don't don't bother with the stuff. Like, I just people are oh, having doubts, having this. The first questions I ask them, like, can you just tell me, like, what's going on with your prayer, with your fasting, with your acts of worship? You know, the, this is talbisu iblis. It makes you, he makes you think that you're, that, so this is, uh, how do you translate Talbis? Um, Cloak, uh, deception? The yeah. deception of Iblis or something yeah. like that. So it's basically just trying to make you think that, oh, I'm trying to get to, um, uh, I'm trying to attain truth and I'm just looking for evidence. And me being skeptical is like, I'm just, you know, going after the truth and I'm studying it and I want to get, attain certainty. And in doing so, you get distracted from your own obligations. You don't actually practice the things that you need to practice. You don't do the things that you need to do, uh, which is what Imam al-Ghazali pointed out in his uh, deliverance from error when he said that, you know, I studied all of the other writers. The only people, we want to talk about a scientific approach that attains you certainty. When he read for what he termed the Sufis, so the spiritual path, which is really just applying the, the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam properly in your life. He said, I found that I, there's only, there's lama far, I have to actually do what they're saying for me to know whether it's true or not. And you have literally 1,400 years of people doing what the Prophet ﷺ told them to do, and they're all certain. Mm. So why don't you just go and go with that methodology? Science, every 100 years, not even now, every 50 years, theories get thrown out. People think one thing, then they believe something else. Well, we have 1,400 years of people doing something exactly. and telling you, if you do this, you will attain certainty. Well, you you know, me and my uh, me and Sheikh Hamar have a friend who is exactly going through this, and I'm scared to ask him after a few discussions whether he's even Muslim because it, it's um, it seems like he's doing a lot of these intellectual gymnastics, and the the line of um, reasoning that he's going towards, I I I can spot it r- really easily that he's going down a very dangerous path. I got to tell you, from my experience, um, if, you, um, if you apply this stuff on your own self, if you are somebody who is always in prayer, always in dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always in salawat of the Prophet you're always, um, you're always, you doing qiyamul layl, you're doing all of these things, and you're somebody who conducts himself as ibadur rahman, as Allah describes him in the Quran, and you're carrying yourself in that way, 
there is a, a nonverbal impact. You know, communication is, what do they say? 93% of it is nonverbal. Well, that nonverbal component is going to come from your own practice, from your own at, uh, application of all of these things in your own life. Hmm. And how you conduct yourself will impact that person. And I've seen that in numerous examples. People that have all these doubts, you know how they maintain their doubts? By limiting their interaction physically with you. They will stay on text message. They will stay on Facebook messaging. Yeah, really they will send you emails. But the idea of interacting you person to person, if they feel that you are impacting them, impacting them in that way where they start to doubt their own doubts, because that's really what they're going to experience, they're going to limit their interaction because they want to maintain that sense of skepticism. And by being with you, they lose it. That's and I've so been around some shiuch, oh, man, that is so you're just like, la ilaha illallah, like there's, there's all the questions you have, all the doubts you have, they dissipate just by being in their presence. Uh, you know, and that's why I think it's very worthy of mentioning right now why that original uh, uh, discussion, discourse happened between Imam al-Bukhari and, and his contemporaries of, you know, and that's why his, his the initial chapter of his is designed as such, is that your actions do affect your iman, right? The original discussion mm -hmm. was that discourse that you have iman and that's it. Your actions don't affect it. Yeah, you may fall short in your actions, but you're always going to have your belief in Allah. But Imam Bukhari, yeah. on the contrast, on the contrary, says that your actions affect your iman. And if your actions are in accordance with Allah, your iman in Allah, your belief in Allah increases and your strength with Allah increases. And if your actions are no longer with Allah, then your relationship with Allah is no longer there, right? That's yeah. that's the first thing. The second thing is, as far as people saying, man, I'm having doubts and stuff, one of the things that I've realized with children between the age of 14 and about 22, 23, is that a lot of times they're actually not having doubts. One example, or actually a few examples, is I've met some teenagers, I've met some people over the age of 20, where I talked to them, I said, okay, you're sure you're having doubts? And Sometimes they just need some reinforcement by just simple words. Listen, you're not having doubts. All right? Just yeah. <laughs> and they're <laughs> yes. like, first I start off with that and tell them, listen, you're not having doubts. Do you believe Allah has won? Yeah. How do you know that, right? By looking at the evidence yeah. all around you, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left evidence, right? Does this all come from nothing? No, it doesn't. Okay, so mm -hmm. you believe in Allah, mm -hmm. right? Yes, of course. Do you believe that Allah sends messengers as human beings so we can actually relate to them so when they give us a message, it's an easy layering for us to accept? Yes. Do you believe Muhammad is the final messenger? Yes. Then yeah. there's no doubts, right? It's like, no, then then you talk into what they're what, what they're actually doubting, what where the doubting comes about. Is it all comes back to this mental gymnastics. Is people that they discuss with are happy with bringing doubts to the table and leaving and not coming up with solutions. That's a play. Mm. That's that's actually it's an it's actually very evil uh, uh, way of, of having a discourse. Is you're not bringing any truth to the table. You're bringing doubts to the table. You think that's a very intellectual thing to do, and you leave. Right. Well, that's mm -hmm. the whole thing. You dis you deconstruct without any reconstruction. There's no reconstruction, like you said. That's that's the dilemma. And we've given platforms it's the, it's to the, people who think the that North they're very the South. smart. Yeah, <laughs> we think that they're Even very that. smart. They're yeah. not actually smart. Right. That's actually the opposite of intellect. That's actually the opposite of 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 uh, of what a, a healthy mind does. Right. Mm -hmm. A healthy mind comes uh, comes to the table to solve problems. Mm -hmm. Not to bring about problems and then leave and thinking that they did something smart, right? Yeah. So there's a couple of points you guys have been talking about the last 20 minutes or so. There's two terms here. There's belief and knowledge, right? So mm -hmm. I was I read um, uh, I don't, Muhammad. Have you read uh, Sea Without Shore? No, I haven't. I haven't uh, managed to get my hand on a copy. Oh, really? I actually read it over it's it's calf. I plowed through it, but Mashallah. there is yeah. a concept within like the seems like the Sufis like seems to talk about a lot is the whole concept of we all as Muslims believe that Allah is our creator and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah etc so right so yeah. Allah, right but then there's this concept of like let's say for example it's like for example you always talk about your mom right in our conversations mm -hmm. right so I know that your mom exists so I know but you know your mom you follow what I'm saying yeah and then there's this level with the Sufis called Marifa yeah yeah which is like cert like that knowledge is beyond just belief which dry mm. so when you read the stories when in the beginning of the, the first part of the book, Sheikh News talking about all these like five like Oliya that he's met in his life. And when you're mm. reading these the stuff they're doing, you're like 
And I was explaining it to, um, you know, non-Muslim, because there were some of my friends at work were asking about like my experience at Itikaf, and so I was sharing them. And I was telling them, and one of them was asking, like, can I read the book? And I was like, this book is too heavy for you. You're not even Muslim yet. This book is too heavy for you. Yeah. You cannot handle this stuff. <laughs> and they were like, what do you mean? I was like, because some of the stuff is going to be like, these guys are so, the stuff they do is so ridiculous as far as like their practice and yeah. whatnot. I was like, you only do that if you have Marifa. Wait, so mm. wait, he, he's met Olia? Sheikh Nu? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, uh, so how do you identify that? I'm uh, just wondering. I don't know. Kind of... I'm, I'm not Sheikh Nu. Uh, what do you, how, how would you identify someone who's a wali of Allah? Based on the Sharia, are they somebody who uh, applies, as Imam Al Junaid said, Man lam yahfadhu al Quran wa yakra sunnah fala yatahadath fi amrina hadha. Who has not memorized the Quran and has mastered the Sunnah, then they let them not speak about this affair of ours. We do not pay attention to any miraculous things that is irrelevant. We don't pay attention to any uh, uh, any things that are out of the ordinary. The only thing you have is, is this person upright? Does this person apply the Quran and the Sunnah in their life? And if they do, they're a wali of Allah. Yeah, I, th- I think what, what Mahin is referring to is sometimes people, they they see somebody and they believe that they're a wali. They, they've given them a certain level of wilaya that only Allah knows, right? There's, at, at I, the end of the day, yeah, yeah, everyone knows that. That's, if, that, bottom that's line, why I'm even, confused. Even a wali like, doesn't know that he's a wali of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Exactly, right? yeah. Even a wali of Allah doesn't know that he's a wali of Allah, right? But mm-hmm. we don't, the, the, the thing that Dr. Ghilan mentioned is very important, is that those who are very adherent to the Qur'an, and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam together, Checkmark. like Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even in the Hadith of Rabbi Nawi, he says what? Man adali waliyan, right? Whoever mm. shows enmity towards my wali, right? What has mm. he done? He's declared war on Allah, or Allah is mm. declaring war on them. So, which brings, which is supposed to bring to our attention something, is number one, we don't know who Allah's wali is. It can mm-hmm. be a very, very impoverished person or a family or a woman or a man they're very very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're very very much in tune with their creator and you may oppress them and you don't know that you're you don't know that they're a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. that's the reason why the hadith is there is ambiguity in the hadith the style of the hadith is what says is letting us he didn't tell us who those people are he told mm-hmm. us that they are there and be very careful on whose toes you step on because they may be a wali of Allah and if you hurt their feelings or if you hurt them then Allah is saying it's on. I mean, I know it's a little scary to think about that, but mm. if you've messed with these people, then you have no mercy yeah. from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the reason why I'm mentioning that is, first, I mean, from what I understand, Allahu alam, we can't say for sure somebody's a wali. You can say, you know, if you see and they remind you of Allah, and like he mentioned, if you're, there's some people in their presence, it's almost as if all of your doubts and anything are just obliterated by being right, in right. the presence because of their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so strong. And their relationship mm. with Allah is so strong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows that to rub off on you basically that's the first thing the second thing is that there's individuals in this world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them some some uh, um, aura if you want to say that it reminds mm. you of Allah just when you see them even from a distance right but even then we say inshallah these are the awliya of Allah like inshallah yeah. someone's a shaheed but we don't know for, yeah because that person still might end up yeah. in like and even the person who's a wali yeah. something you'll realize is some of those people who are so pious they actually believe that they're the worst of creation. Right, right. I, was, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, think about Umar radiallahu anhu. He he goes to Hudayfa in his khilafa. He says, "Listen, he strong arms him. Listen, I'm your Khalifa. Was <laughs> I on that list that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned seventy of the hypocrites? Right, right. I mean, that's that's a true wali of Allah. So, so, so I guess I mean, I'll, yeah. so. This this we were. I'll, I'll shit, Muhammad. I'll tell you. We, we were chat. The three of us were chatting last night at like three in the morning. And then Sim okay. was uh, so <laughs> Sim told uh, uh, me that like dang it Amr and Mahin I was thinking about you guys uh, during my Fajr Salah was screwing me up I was like Mashallah that's a karamat you saw the awliya in your vision <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that means uh, me, I'm not at least cause I, I I attributed wilaya to myself <laughs> yeah. I think Amr might still qualify you being part of the rebellious group of East Pakistan negates any I, 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 I actually call out the Kharajites of East Pakistan <laughs> <laughs> You've disassociated yourself from them. Because I, I, the, the, those fish bones, I can't do that, fish man. Bones. We we traded Nahari for fish bones. For real, give me a break. <laughs> Ooh boy, I hope there's no uh, 
diehard historians that are mm-hmm. that feel very strong about this <laughs> hear this because they're gonna go off on you, son. <laughs> it's all good. I just block them <laughs> or delete the post. I don't even know how we got there. <laughs> Anyways, no, but uh, that's no, the why, whole, that's why you're on the mad bum. But the concept of whole, I think, I think, I think it's trying to understand like there's. Cause it seems to be as Muslims, like by default, a lot of Muslims are like we start with belief, right? But then, you, mm. and you talked about the concept, which is really interesting. The whole concept of looking around us. And like, like for example, the fudger and like the night and etc. Right. So one thing mm. I, it reminded me, I was in Philadelphia for work, like I don't know, like five six weeks ago. And the thing about Philadelphia is that there is a um, an absurd amount of homelessness compared to any mm. other city I've seen in America. It's like third world level. Like wow. they've got like rows and rows of people just camped out there. And then I remember, um, I have one of the nights I happened to just re- recite Surah Al Fajr. And I and I was reciting the verse where they're where he's talking about how the people of uh, Firaun and Thamud and they neg- they were neglectful to the um to the orphans and then the poor they didn't care mm. for the poor and that reading it then affected me in a way I've never read it before. Subhanallah. And mm. I, was, I was thinking about all the people and I remember some you know just v- you're like pulled to like give to these people at the time. Like, you know, yeah. I don't know. They, they might have drug problems. Who knows? I normally, in Chicago, you just pass it by them. But, like, the prevalence yeah. of it was so, like, dire, I thought, was uh was interesting. So, I, I, I but the thing that people talk about a lot, and you talked about a lot on your own podcast, is that there's this intellectual, the intellectual rationale behind proving God and understanding God takes you only so far. You have to start yeah. practicing to get to that next level, that next paradigm. Yeah. yeah, and it's not for everyone either because there's a lot of people that believe, right? It's only for that other group of people that Imam Ghazali also talks about is where their mind is something that has somewhat become too, I don't want to say too powerful for their own good, but it they're, it's kind of, it, they don't know how to use it properly. It's intent, it's, it's it's untamable for them, right? Right, because like, like, like your grandma, right? She's not going to have any yeah, doubts. He describes it as medicine. Imam Ghazali describes it as medicine for those people. Yes, okay, exactly. Yeah. Because they, My that's what they're kind of woman. You know, she didn't need any of this stuff. Of course not. Of course not. Because that it's it's finding Allah through simplicity is the easiest and most satisfying way of finding Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You don't even need yeah. to find. You know, right? Um, well, the 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 idol of this age is the intellect. You know, gone are the times of Hubal and and Ad and Wood and Suwa and all of these idols that people used to prop up and worship. This age is the age of intellectual idolatry. We construct theories and 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 ideas, and we come up with narratives or whatever, and then we believe our own con- constructs. We believe that what we say is true, and yep. we use that to judge everything else, and it's that becomes thought. our source of morality, our source of truth, and our source of uh, be, you know do and don't do, which is really what worship is. So our intellect has become the aid, the modern idol, um, and so you have to kind of remember what the the role of the intellect is not to um, come up with things in new. The intellect and rationality is to work with what's out available to you already. Mm. Yeah. I was and distinguish between it. Yeah, what was it? so like? But the point about like our grandmothers, right? If you like went to our villages in like Bangladesh or Hyderabad or whatever, and you start mm-hmm. telling them like doubts about Islam, like Ali Rizvi <laughs> or somebody, <laughs> and then be like, they just look at you like crooked. No, they but, look at you crooked. They hit you with the. They but hit you at the, the same time, I was <laughs> just gonna say like, forget about that. Even my own mother is now about to slap me <laughs> sometimes but, if she hears me talk. But and... check this out though. It, 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 don't like Bible thumping Christians say the same thing that you just don't know. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. Like, even the intellectual reasoning, like, they won't be like, well, like, they say they have certainty that Jesus Christ gave them salvation, right? So, how, mm. so, so isn't that, like, don't we open up that, living in America, I mean, this is, I feel like there's no other religion other than the Christians, like, a, a hardcore Christian would say that. Like, you get into a debate with them, and there's, like, I just, I just know. Like, no, nothing you tell me can change that. Yeah, but I think that's the difference between knowing and, and, and believing is that when you say something that is actually not true, right? They're saying something that's not true. The Holy Spirit's within me, and I've seen, or they say, yeah. I talk to God. And we know, right, universally understood uh, a fact that nobody is actually talking to God. We know that there's no spirit 
you know, unless if it's a gin or something, that's something else. But if they it come inside of them and it's like it speaks for us, so I know for sure. But do you actually know what does what is knowing now, right? And well, I know I, what Mahin is saying. It's like he's talking about because if you if you've seen some of those guys, they speak with such utter conviction. Oh, like yeah. it's a great act. I, I absolutely it. know. Yeah. Um, and it's I I have to be honest. I you know with these individuals, there is an element of truth in Christianity. It's like the problem that we have when we talk to Christians or any other religion is that we assume off right that it's all false. Yeah. Um, but it's not. It's what you're asking a Christian to do when you when you're telling them Islam is the way is to make adjustments to their belief system. We're not even asking them to reject Jesus Christ. We're like, no, no, Jesus Christ is there, or the Virgin Mary, all of that is there. Yes. We just you just need to stop talking about you know the the belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is where we have a problem. Yeah. Not in anything else other than that. Um, and so what what they feel, what they experience as true are the true elements of Christianity. And for you to try to deny them that is actually unjust. You're right. I like it. Because also, isn't it the whole thing where you, we, um, because when they pray to what they call God the Father, that's Allah, right? Yeah. And so I've always yes. understood that Allah, no, no matter who the person is, every human being is a creation of Allah. And if that human being calls on Allah, then Allah will not like neglect that human being, right? So... Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you even have like, um, and the, this is why I heard another like clip from uh from I've been after Steve was out sure I've been binging on anything from Sheikh New that I can get, but he was talking about somebody asked him a question mm -hmm. about non-Muslim mystics and their like spiritual elevation, and he's like, well, listen, uh -huh. the soul is a kind of like the human being is a kind of mechanism with the body and the soul that if you like put the body the needs of the body in check and the soul elevates like a monk. Right, like there's this yeah. guy in the UK named uh, Jay Shetty. He's like this Indian dude who spent like five years living as a monk, and uh, you know, it was like, it's like they will achieve some kind of spiritual like you know high because they they're, they're doing what is necessary to elevate the soul, regardless of their faith. Mm. They it doesn't mm -hmm. get them anywhere necessarily. At the end of the day, it's like, or they might know God, but Iblis knew God too. So that's what he's kind of getting to at the end of the yeah. day. You know, the well, whole point. Do you think he's actually? But you also have to keep. Yeah. No, I'm just wondering, like, some of these mystics that are from other religions, um, are they, uh, are they just uh, triggering certain neural responses or chemical responses that may occur in the brain that um, may be similar to what other Muslim mystics, or is this all like, um, you know, the same? Are they pushing the same buttons to get the the same response? Well, even if you, um, I'm sure if you try to look at Muslim mystics, it would be the same thing. It's correlation, not causation. Um, that your neural responses are going to be there, dopamine being released and serotonin and whatnot. But um, you have to keep in mind that uh, Allah's mercy is so vast that even when it comes to polytheism and idolatry, he, he predicates it on something, on knowledge. Do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa antum ta'lamun. Knowingly. So there is, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا we were not going to punish anybody until we send a messenger. And so uh, looking at people today, even to this day, I'm meeting people in prominent metropolitan cities. The, the movement of disinformation and misinformation is so powerful that even in a setting like a university, you can come across students, even when they try to search for the truth, when they go to the library, they're exposed to books that are not telling them the truth. They're written by, uh, you know, extremist evangelicals who are trying to, who claim that, for example, and I've seen this at the University of Victoria myself, Christians distributing books that claim that Muslims worship a moon god, and it's a lat, and it was just a word that was kind of messed up a little bit to say it's a law. And so they, it's, and in a university setting, so what else do you want from somebody that's looking for truth, and they're doing what they can with whatever information that they have, just to be fair to people, you know, that they're trying, and that's what they come across, and so when they reject it, they're actually rejecting falsehood. Hmm. They're not rejecting Islam. They're rejecting a vision of Islam that they were presented, which was false. And that's what Imam al-Ghazali talks about in Fasal Tafriqa. Some people who are non-Muslim that reject Islam, it's because they were presented with, a, with a, an idea of Islam that actually contradicts the fitrah itself. And so those people from Imam al-Ghazali's perspective, he says, according to the mercy of Allah and what's said in the Quran and his understanding of the Sunnah, these people would also be saved. They would not be uh, put into paradise because you're now, you can't, 
يكلفوا غير بغير ما يطاق you know they're being given an obligation that is above their means now they went they looked they sought they went to the right places they looked in the library and with all of that they still found books that were misinformation and they this is what they made their decision based on what else do you want from them mm. yeah Sheikh Uthay Min Rahimahullah is a similar fatwa I think somebody asked him about the uh, people in America like middle of nowhere and he, and he they were having the conversation and he and they were like, well, he was like, well, the only exposure they had, the Muslims, they never met anybody. It's just like the media and like what they see on TV and terrorism, et cetera. And mm-hmm. then he's like, yeah, of course. He's like, that would also apply to them. So you, just to be, you have to, the thing is about when, when we talk about punishment and stuff, the Quran is speaking, the Quran was revealed to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, And by extension, it's addressing us as well, individually. So when you read in the Quran, and you recite verses that relate to punishment and entrance into the hellfire and descriptions of people that will go into that, your first position is, this is Allah talking to you directly. So if you adopt these behaviors, if you adopt these beliefs, this is where you will end up. Before you start talking about other people, look into your own self first. Then beyond that, look at these qualities as abstract descriptions, not related to individuals. Because you don't know what people know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who knows what's in the heart. Even shaitan doesn't know what's in the heart. Shaitan doesn't know why people are doing what they're doing. Shaitan whispers, tries to persuade, but he doesn't know exactly this is the reason why. Is the person just being arrogant and rejecting truth because they're just a straight up active form of kufr? Or is this person struggling with something and they've had experiences and their, their previous associations with religion have always been negative? Um, and so they reject it because of that. They, th- these are difficult things that people tackle. And um, I go from the principle of charity. You know, give people the benefit of the doubt. And if I, in my heart, find enough mercy that to give excuses to people, maybe they just don't know. Maybe they got the wrong idea. Maybe they just didn't understand. If I have that, hmm. well, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is much more merciful than I can ever be. So I'm okay. I'm not like, Allah, you're not more merciful than Allah. And you're not more just than Allah. So just let it be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These things with regards to non-Muslim Muslim, they're actually about us in this world right now with regards to legal rulings. Can you marry a non-Muslim? What about burial rights, inheritance? These are the things that we deal with for this world. This is, these, categorizations, <clears throat> these categorizations are for us for now just to facilitate our fiqh, not to facilitate our judgments over people's hereafter. So in that case, what, someone could have asked, like, let's say there's someone who's a Muslim, who's a convert, and um, their parents passed away, and they're, they died upon, apparently, kufr. Then, you know, they would say on that train of thought, I should be able to ask Allah for their, you know, you know protection in the hereafter. I just, uh, you know what, the position of the scholars, as far as I understand it, is that you do not play for a disbeliever, but if you look in the Quran... With regards to Ibrahim alayhi salam, فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ When it's become very clear to him that his father or his uncle, depending on the position that you take, um, was this is this is a straight up act of kufr. That's when he did bara'a from him. That's when he dissociated from him. So there's always this. It's always predicated on knowledge in the Quran that and clear dis- description and criterion. Um, you're not going to, um, even if you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's say you're a convert and you say, oh Allah, please forgive them. You're not going to go to hell for praying for somebody because you thought that maybe Allah will forgive them or whatever. You don't know any of this stuff. So I just let people be. I don't actually get into these things. Do you want to pray for your parents? Go ahead and pray for your parents. I'm not. It's not the end of the world. I'm not trying to uh, water down the religion in that sense. But the, I'm acknowledging my own ignorance of the state of your parents. I don't know what they knew. You don't know what they know. You don't know why they decided to be the way that they are. You don't know what they thought about Islam. You, you really don't know. Unless they've actively fought against you and shown you animosity and all of that stuff, you just don't know. It's all with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah says in the, in the Quran, and this is, not, this is the problem with perennialists. Perennialists take it a little bit too far. In the Quran, Allah says with regards to the Jews and the Magians and the Christians and whoever believes in, the, in Allah on the day after, um, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's going to yafsilu baynahum. He's the one who's going to determine between them for what they were differing upon. And those who had belief in Allah and the, and the day of judgment, la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. There will be no fear upon them and there is no sadness over them. There's no sorrow over them. Um, so in other words, Allah will take care of them. You look at the tafsir, they will tell you, oh, it's about people that have come before Islam and then once Islam has come, it abrogates. You can see all of these different opinions. But at the end of the day, it's Allah's business. This is not my domain. Now, a non-Muslim who's feeling like they want to pray for their parents and just, you know what, I'm not going to restrict the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of, uh, you know, just to push a particular ruling on somebody. If they feel emotionally driven to do that, I'm not going to say yes or no. I'm just going to let them be. I'm not going to interject myself and tell them what to do. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me. The hardest thing for people to do with religion is that you want to maintain this balance between asserting the truth of your faith, that this is the truth. This is the Salat al-Mustaqim. There is no other way. But then look even at the verse, the way that it's uh, the way that Allah revealed it. So there is this active component to it that you are seeking. Whoever seeks other than Islam for a religion. All right, what about people who were born into something? This is how they were conditioned all their lives. They've had all of these prejudices and biases and all of this psychological baggage that they have with regards to religious belief and the education system, which is really more of an indoctrination system. And you've got all of these things that you need to work through. And top it off with our terrible representation as Muslims, because at the end of the day, we're we're terrible representatives of the religion. We're not acting right. If you look at the, the social security and welfare systems, the, the amount of frauds that Muslims commit with regards to that. Uh, if you look at the bribery, if you look at Muslim countries, the state that we're in, at the end of the day, we are our own undoing. We can't blame, you can't, we can talk about and break down colonization and the foreign powers and all that, but at the end of the day, like so we put oppressors over other oppressors because of what they were earning. So the reason Muslims are in the state that we're in right now is because we are oppressors ourselves and Allah put oppressors over us. Allah is not going to change the condition of a people until they change what's within themselves. So I'm big on this. Let's take responsibility for our own, affair, our own affairs and our own state the way that we are and the representation that we give of Islam to people. And it's a, a poor one at that. So it's very difficult. You know, Put yourself in the other person's shoes. If you're a non-Muslim, and all you see from Muslims and, and about Islam in the media and in, in, in your daily interactions are all of these negative stereotypes and things. And you're just, you're being a good person, you're, let's say you are a Christian, you're a believing Christian, you're a Catholic, you're whatever, and you're doing as best as you can. And you believe in that. And what you were pre presented with with Islam was just something that turned your fitra, I'm not talking about your arrogance or anything, just your fitra was turned off by that. Because it was oppressive towards women, let's say, you saw domestic abuse, you saw a lot of uh, corruption, you saw all of that, and you just rejected that. And what you find in your religion is serenity, truth, calmness, peace. You see from your church that you're the ones who are doing charitable work, you're the ones feeding the homeless, you're doing all of these things. So you're the most beloved of all people to Allah is the one who's bringing the most benefit to people. So you're doing all of these things, you're experiencing spiritual elevations from the activities that you're doing, and then you pass away. You worked with what you had. This is the information that you had and you did as best as you could and you saw it. You, even if it was mistaken, you were seeking Allah's pleasure as best as you could with whatever information that you had. If I as a human being, a limited human being, I'm able to see through all of that and give you the benefit of the doubt. I'd be like, you know what? You were sincere at least. You tried. Do your best. And there were all these factors that just prevented you from seeing the light of Islam as it should be seen. And that's why like now even, you know, like um, the podcast I'm going to be releasing in a couple of weeks with regards to homosexuality and stuff. It is unfair the way that even Muslims now are, become, are going about it. It is totally unfair to non-Muslims who are engaged in all kinds of uh, activities and lifestyles that are condemned in Islam, that are punishable, that whole people were destroyed by, Qawmulut were literally destroyed by it in the Quran. It is unfair for Muslims now to approach this stuff and talk about it in a wishy-washy way and let people kind of like, oh, it's fine, it's all good, you know, there's ambiguities about this and, and treat it like it's okay. What are you going to do on the Day of Judgment when these people come and ask you, you were a Muslim, you had the Quran and you had the Sunnah and you had all of the truth and you didn't tell me anything because you thought you would hurt my feelings. Mm. And so the way that we're approaching all of this stuff is really problematic and it, I get emotional about it because I'm afraid 
for my own sake on the day of judgment when Allah when I'm afraid to see people on the day of judgment that I know it concerns me and it gets me really emotional because I want to share something but at the same time I, I have this element of trepidation because oh you know like what you have the truth act right man like what's wrong with you just act right and be right and everything will be fine and, and just be a proof of Islam walking just on your own you don't have to talk about it you just act right and when you're asked answer clearly don't be wishy-washy about it. Anyways, sorry. And, no, no, it. please, man. And as far as this podcast is concerned, you said you're releasing in what three weeks? Um, um. So this coming week is a Q and A one, and then the one following it, inshallah. Two okay. weeks, inshallah. So, like, so let me ask you something. So, I th I think we would generally agree. I would. I, I don't want to put words in people's mouth, but like the atheists have doubt themselves that's part of their whole like <laughs> like world view right but like yeah do, do, don't you do, do you believe that like a, a, a practicing christian or a jew or someone of another faith tradition that they don't have some kind of doubt whether they admit it or not and that's something that that deep down inside is gnawing at them because they're upon something that isn't true one of the companions i can't remember the name of maybe sheikh Hamer can remind me but um he was he was walking out and, and he was in a, in a very bad state. And Abu Bakr Sadiq who saw him. And he said to him, what's wrong with you? And he said, I th I'm thinking of things that I would rather fall from the sky than to utter with my tongue. And Abu Bakr Sadiq who understood what he was talking about said, me too. Oh, Let's go to the Messenger of Allah. Allah, Allah. Allah I think. Huh? Was that the, the hadith of Hanzala? Uh, yeah, Hanzala. Yes, yes, yes. And so they, yeah, and so they go to the Messenger of Allah and let him know. And he saw Allah said, that's belief. That's now you're in a state of yaqeen now. That's it's because you're experiencing these things. It's when you don't have any doubts whatsoever, that's when you should have a problem. You need to always be in the state of questioning and concern about your state. That's consciousness. That's you becoming that's preventing you from falling in a state of ghafla. So it's totally fine for you to be in that state and, and to have these doubts, whether you're a Christian or Muslim or whatever. And that's what drives you towards confirming, am I on the right path? Am I doing the right thing? So I, I don't know the commentary in the hadith, but like, couldn't it be sometimes where the companions were concerned about like their, their iman. salvation? Yeah, their iman, right? actually, their relationship with Allah. Or if they would die upon Islam, right? These kind yeah. of things. Not necessarily whether, like, so when because when you hear that, you could look at it from one way, is like... Like, uh, is Islam true? Maybe is this all a game, right? Is this is a scam that we're just getting duped. Like are that we, thought. Are we in the Matrix? Right, something <laughs> like that. Like these <laughs> random thoughts cross your head, right? And that's it, where that's where practice comes in. That's where you have to. I mean, I ask people in Ramadan, do you feel these things? So far, I have not come across a single person that tells me in Ramadan they feel these things, and they always attribute it to. But Shaitan is tied up, and that's why I'm not getting whisperings, and so I'm feeling good. No, it's because in Ramadan. You are much more uh, diligent with your prayers. You are reciting Quran all the time. You're praying at night. You're doing dhikr whenever you have free time. It's because you're engaged in all of the right things. And so that's where you got your certainty from. It's not because shaitan is not around. It's because you're doing your part. And during the rest of the time, the rest of the year, you're not. You're just doing the bare minimum. Yeah, and, and so just if one you want clarification. To, oh, sorry, go ahead. So if you want to eliminate that type of doubt, there is no religion that has the elements of acts of worship prescribed from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through Jibreel Alayhi Salam from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala do it like this and this is how you can connect with me as Allah will tell you that's yeah. what Salah is called Salah is the connection it's from Salah it's to connect with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala you cannot be in a state of Salah and feel doubts after that if you do it properly and, and you know I, just a, a clarification uh, as far as I heard many khatibs say this too during Ramadan also that you know there is no shaitan that's here in Ramadan no it's Iblis that's locked up the ringleader yeah the head hancho he's the one that's yeah. locked up there's still shayatin there but they're not as effective but they're still there right the, yeah. the little minions are around 
It's kind of like if Sim got locked up and there was me and Shake Armor running around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, oh boy, <laughs> you know, that's so, why so, we're the mad Mamluks. <laughs> Some people go into the cough. I get locked up. <laughs> that's true. Think, it was actually good when Mahin was in the cough. Of Everything was better when Mahin was in the cough. Where we go wrong with a lot of these discussions and and why they feel unsatisfactory to a lot of even the listeners. I'm sure some of them are going to be unsatisfied with this. Of course. It's because there is this element of practice that people just, for whatever reason, refuse to do. It's like somebody that wants to sit down on YouTube. The way I look at it, you sit down on YouTube, you look, you watch Generation Iron, you watch uh, Nick's Strength and Power channel, you watch all of the workout stuff, you watch all the diet stuff, you listen to Joe Rogan with all the different dietary recommendations, uh, you read all of the different articles on dieting and working out, you download all the workout routines, you assess and analyze all the different workout routines, you read papers, you go to PubMed, you even you, you elevate your level, your game up a little bit, you go to PubMed. You download papers on workout and protein synthesis and how many 48 hours or 72 hours and if you fast this long or that long or how <laughs> like how it impacts you and all of these things. Like you me. come up with the best workout routine yeah. and in nowhere in any of this stuff had you gone to a gym. Nope. No one wants to put the work yeah, in. Yeah, no. I, I, I'm the biggest – I am the biggest advocator of like – Intermittent fasting and dieting, but I'm still a fat slob. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's funny because like, he, the, so the, 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 we're not that fat. We, 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 we have a, a friend of ours named Wally Khan, right? Well, Wally's like a big into like health and fitness, right? Mm-hmm. But he yeah. follows like this ma- like eat like the macro like um if it meets your macro kind of like diet. He's always been like that, right? And so I remember yeah. when I was doing ketogenic diet like a year and a half ago. And I was on it for like a, like a week, right. and I was telling him how his thing was wrong, <laughs> even though this guy like. <laughs> and here we are talking about fitness, and I got a pizza and wings order on the way. <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's, I ordered it while the show. That, that's that's the interesting part of the human being, right? Uh, as long as it's contained within our cranium, it's very enticing. It's very nice, but that's where action amal is the is is the shortcoming, right? Putting action, putting in the work is the most difficult part, which is why it's much easier to think about it and talk about it. Right? Yeah. It doesn't always mean that you're a munafiq. It doesn't always mean you're a hypocrite. It just means that you're lazy. Right? Well, it's like we were, we were talking about offline. We were talking about offline. So, like, remember, um, like, so Muhammad and I were we were just chit chatting before the show about how. So you guys mentioned like, my itikaf, how you guys got you you guys or iman went up because I was an itikaf. <laughs> 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 but, uh, <laughs> but uh, but one thing is I didn't tell anybody. Um. You know that I, I didn't tell. I think I mentioned on the pot one of our mid, Ramadan roundtable podcasts that I was gonna like kind of do it, but I didn't like go blast it to like everybody that I thought might try to get a hold of me. Like my wife knew. I figured it was bad enough someone would like Facebook. But I thought maybe Noreen would have like uh, forgotten or something and uh, try to get a hold of me. It was like oh she can message my wife and find out that like you know hey I'm not available for a podcast or something right. Yeah, not a big deal. But but the thing is I didn't tell anybody because I was like worried that. I, I made the intention for it, but I wasn't sure if something would pop up that would force me to break it. You follow what I'm saying? And then you yeah. like tell all these people like, "Yo, I'm gonna do nine day." <sighs> and I and I and I and I did it without with like even taking my smartphone in and all that stuff. And if I told if I announced that, like I didn't know if I was gonna like midway through and like tell some kid like, "Hey, go to my car wouldn't. and get my smartphone." I'm 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 like having withdrawal. I'm like having like you know like like. You- what was those things, the convulsions? Because <laughs> I don't have you gotta uh, Instagram. You got to put into work. I mean, the way I look at it is um, <laughs> Muslims, most of us, uh, we're like somebody who takes steroids but doesn't go to the gym. Yes, Allah. <laughs> we recite the Quran. Many memorize the Quran even. Look at the Hadith. Recite the Hadith. You know, teach it even. But when it comes to application, nothing. Yeah. You're just like somebody who takes steroids and doesn't go to the gym. It's not going to make you big. I mean, people that... Uh, look at people's. Oh, he's on steroids. That's why he's that big. No, the guy is busting his butt in the gym. He's working out really hard. The steroids are helping him synthesize protein faster and grow a little bit bigger. But without that resistance, without actually working out and watching his diet properly, they're not going to do anything. So, same thing with this stuff. If any any of the listeners that are going through these things and and wondering, and you know what, there's a fascinating verse that also scares me. Um, it's from Surah Az-Zumar. وَإِذَا ذَكَرَ وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ إِشْمَأَزَّتْ قُلُوبُ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ دُونِهِ إِذَا هُمْ يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ When Allah is mentioned by Himself, those who do not believe in the in the uh, day after, in the in the final day, their hearts will become a little bit. Um, they will shrink, 
And when anything other than Allah is mentioned, you'll find them joyful. In other words, when I tell you, Allah says, His Messenger says, do this, do this, do that, don't do that, don't do that, your heart feels a little bit of a constriction. And when I tell you about all these different philosophers and consciousness and certainty and discussions and Descartes and Bertrand Russell, and let's talk about all these different philosophers, you're happy, you're joyous. You want to hear more about it. You want to discuss more. Yeah. There's that irritation that kind of comes in your ear, right? Like, I, I remember until um, uh, someone close to me pointed out to me uh, a few years ago, like, hey, you notice like well, when I am keep on reminding you about uh, doing this one now or doing that, like you get kind of irritated, like, like mm -hmm. he, oh, he he noticed. I'll just give an example. Like, um, I was drinking glass of uh, water with my left hand instead of my right hand, right? And mm. and I, he saw some frustration in my in my eyes. Like he pointed out to me, like you know, it's kind of bugging you when I'm saying this, right? I'm like, yeah, it, it, it's kind of annoying when you you keep on pointing yeah. it out to me. Isn't that drinking with the urine of Satan? <laughs> what? When you drink water with your left hand, I, I, I heard that before once. Is that true? I don't know if that's true. I should, Anyways, I'm a, sorry, maybe. Well, but, sorry, but anyway, but he but, 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 but what one. he's just talking about, you know, that that irritation of no, no, it happens, dude. And you know what? What it is? I think there's light at the end of the tunnel, and it's a checking point, right? What you guys are very much talking about of being annoyed. And this is Allah tells us about this. Anything Allah tells us about ourselves in the Quran, He's telling us about ourselves to teach us who we are so we have a stronger relationship with Allah. And yeah. he's, he's telling us, of, of he's basically just telling us who we are. And we didn't know that unless it was for Allah. So the first thing is that the reason why we we sense that is that's the litmus test. Is when I'm reminded of obeying the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. Am I getting annoyed or am I running towards it and am I trembling in fear? If we're getting annoyed, which is probably a majority of the human beings, is and that mm. means we have a lot to work on as far as our nafs and controlling uh, uh, our, our our feelings and our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you know. And mm. and and but if, but you know what's really annoying though? Uh -huh. Some people's uh, adhan reminders. They're, they have the most terrible qari. <laughs> no, no, like no, no, no. Blaring, <laughs> blah, blah. No, it's just really no. Pick I, a good qari. I, I think we should I won't have separate get podcasts. Of, we should have a separate podcast of the masjids should choose a good muazzin, and if he's not good. Just have a child dude who has a good adhan. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes the, the adhan that's... No, we'll I'm, talk talking, about I'm just talking about the phone the apps. apps. I know. I know you are. Yeah, and, and, and well, yeah, that, that's but... true as well that there are some masjids <laughs> that have like a, a an 80-year-old man who can barely speak. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not the best speaker. I'm I'm just saying Sounds like like, well, like this this is like the most inviting call to Islam and you have like an eighty year old man who's just barely breathing. Oh my uh, god, were you here last week or something? <laughs> no, I go to the small masjid for Juma near my workplace. Man, I don't know why they I I think it's just out of respect, like they they push this man up there, like hey, Say the other. I'm like, man, this could be somebody's. I could be bringing uh, a coworker to the masjid, uh, and having him hear this thing that the, he's, that's called the other. Man, that, honestly so, though, like I, we have the same situation in our masjid here. <laughs> the one I that I go this. to, anyways. <laughs> and um, I always feel a sense of shame when I get these thoughts because when he finishes the other. He does the du'a after the adhan, and you can sense the love of the Prophet ﷺ in his heart when he says, yeah. and the way that he makes a du'a, you feel like the weight of the years of him making that du'a. Mm. Yeah. And so for me, it's like, you know what? Do the adhan, man. Like, I, I know it's terrible, and your voice is cracking, and you're just... <laughs> but just the dua at the end you're like you can tell that this person loves the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and so you're like all right i'm just gonna be quiet <laughs> yeah you know that's one thing that like um that and now that we're on this we digress a little bit it's we like it, I, <laughs> no, it's Ramadan. like so like sometimes you know it's back to the ego thing right because i think a lot of times we talked about about like, when you're getting advice from somebody right sometimes it's there's a couple of things it depends if Sheikh Amr gave me advice on something, I'd probably listen to it. If Sim gave me advice, I'd probably blow it off because, <laughs> like, he went to Azhar and no, he went to it COD. To do with that. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with and, that. And mine's a scholar worshiper. <laughs> 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 of course. Guys, wait. Hey, one, first thing I want to say is 
Dr. Rilan, I don't think you've laughed this much on a podcast. I think you're, I, this is, I think that we're making a little mad here. And I want to bring <laughs> this, this is, back this to is joyous. course. This is joyous, mashallah. This guy. No, no, no. I want to talk about this because Mahin has this uh, problem. I think it's a, it's a problem in the heart. <laughs> he, he, every time there's a scholar, he's, he over glorifies him. <laughs> he, he, he won't take from uh, the I, activists. I have respect from the people of knowledge. Sheikh Hamer, can you talk about the that one? Um, what was it? Hadith that story that, that the rivalry between the scholars and the the the, the, the duat. isn't it like the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets, not the activists? <laughs> no, we're, we're, so by the way, we're not we're not we're not talking about. <laughs> oh, no, anyways, guys, we're, we're not talking about activists in the sense like the, you know uh, some of the marchers that are in Washington or anything. We're talking about the, the Islamic activists. So uh, <laughs> no, I I think I think there's one thing. Uh, just because somebody has attained a certain certificate from an institution, it doesn't mean they're the people of Iman. That's first and foremost, right? Yeah. Um, so there's some people, man, I'm telling you, my my gatekeeper when I was living in Egypt was this person who, if you were to see him, you would think, and the way he talks and not even able to speak Arabic properly, you would think that, oh my God, what's with this guy? But the level and every weight that, every weight that his words had was so profound that you know, it mm. doesn't it doesn't matter what level of knowledge people have. Yeah, it can be. It is definitely a good thing if if the person has a combination of knowledge and action and and, and relationship with Allah. But you know that has nothing to do with anything. I would rather listen to Sim than myself, to be honest with you. I go to Sim for advice. I don't know what you're talking about, Mahin. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I I go to Sim if I want to know something is halal. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, Hala, go ahead, do it. It's like, I, I always you know, say, honestly, I, I like have the Mufti Abu Layth opinion. Take, and take the easiest sense. route. <laughs> oh, he just, just threw, he just people, threw Mufti Abu Layth like, are not here. necessarily scholars. Yeah. They just tell you the, the good straight up. And sometimes you need to just hear the thing as it is. You don't yep. need all this obfuscation and intellectual constructs and usuli principles. And just tell me straight up, like, do or don't do. And sometimes you just need to hear just straight up like that. And you know what? I was very fascinated with the story of Omar radiallahu anhu. I know sometimes we hear it and we laugh about it, but it's very relevant to the topic we were speaking of is that there was, I can't remember who uh, the individual was that was just asking some philosophical questions. And Omar radiallahu anhu, he goes, wait, just wait for me right here. And he comes back, he brings a stick and he starts beating him yeah. with a stick, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if you really, if you think that, that's actually a very profound story. Yeah. Because what yeah. Omar radiallahu anhu did, he made him, he 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 forced him back into reality by inflicting him with pain with a stick. Yeah. Right? And what happens yeah. when you're inflicted with pain? All of us, when we're inflicted with pain, we always rush to Allah. Whether you uh, uh, are a Muslim or non-Muslim, we always reach out to this higher power. If you're a non-Muslim, and if you're a Muslim, we all make that dua: Oh Allah, you know, mm -hmm. take me out of the situation, and I'll worship you forever. I'll That's be the actually. Best Muslim. An... That's so true, you know. And uh, Joe Rogan speaking because we spoke about him earlier. There was one clip where he was talking about uh, seeing his daughter for the first time when she was born. Mm. And he d d he describes how emotional and the, the feelings that he had, he's never imagined. He's like, I never knew there was this type of emotion. You know, he never knew love existed in the way that it does when he saw his daughter. And he didn't have a way to articulate it properly. But it's just like, you're right. Like, you have these significant experiences. Yeah. Of life, for example, being brought into the world or being taken from the world. Let me tweet tweet that significant significant experiences of truth that are just mm. smacking you right in the face, right? Yeah, yes, sir. And so once you do that, all of a sudden, all of these things just don't matter anymore. And you're like, huh? You, I don't know. You know, it's amazing that you just brought that up because a lot a lot of people come to me. You know, just young younger kids and whatnot. They ask me about um, how or why. You know, non-Muslims go to hell and things like that. And I, I, I told them like, hey, did you live your life through their eyes? Did you see all mm -hmm. the truths that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave them in mm -hmm. their lives? Of course. You know, the, yeah, you you don't know important. like all the reminders Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is giving them from their first person view. You're only looking at it from the external view, and you know you're you're sympathizing with their dilemma, but you don't know what the what their life and their course was where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala kept on giving them reminders after mm. reminders and they kept on willfully ignoring it and mm. you you in all your compassion are sympathizing and are crying over their demise but in actuality you should be feeling like you know uh you, you should be succumbing to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision over them exactly man mm. everything is everything is a decision of allah everything that's what i try to mm -hmm. tell my my students also man every single situation that you're in allah 
place that there for a reason. And even if you're going to go do something haram and someone just stumbles upon you and says, hey, let's go to the gym, Allah just saved you from a haram, right? That's mm-hmm. Allah's favor upon you. It's so, it may seem so insignificant to you or, uh, uh, you know, it just happens to be a coincidence. There's no such thing. You know, if Allah is taking away from something he did and someone to be faced with such a reality. And that's one thing you're right. You know, I don't want to give Joe Rogan too much credit after a lot of the stuff that he talks about as far as anti-Islam is concerned. But one thing I'll tell you is the guy has had some awesome experiences. He articulates them very well. And that's something that is is a sign of Allah to him. You know what I'm saying? Allah yeah, subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah. is giving him numerous signs, especially in his art of articulating things and the way he discusses things sometimes. You know, I have to give him credit. He's, he's, he can be he can be a very It's not just articulation. Person. He's able to talk to dumb people like me and, and being it able to ex- explain like um, complex things in a very simple manner. Exactly. Exactly. And, and he that doesn't itself... strike me as somebody who's arrogant either. No, he's not. I don't think so, he is. You know, I, I pray for people like that. Like he doesn't – he strikes me as somebody who's genuinely – like if you just break it down to him and he just gets away from the influence of the Sam Harris's of the world. That's why they need just, a Dr. Gilan, man. Yeah. That's why he needs Dr. <laughs> Gilan and Joe Rogan. Tweet it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Dr. Gilan and Joe Rogan show. Real quick, Sim, did you say these kids asked you how non-Muslims are going to hellfire? Yeah, so like I, I've taught Sunday school for a few years and yeah. things like that. So a lot of people – a lot of these younger kids will ask um, – me these type of questions like wait why why are they going to hellfire oh i thought you meant how like if i would ask me how i'd be like what happens is the angels grab him by their forelock <laughs> and throw him into hellfire and then the hellfire asks them are there any more <laughs> and then they get served like boiling pus oh to drink <laughs> oh. this is exactly my reactions in the gym when i'm listening to you guys <laughs> i'm in the middle of a set i'm trying to push this weight <laughs> and then my hand goes off on it <laughs> Man, Maheen is definitely mad. He's mashallah, man. The guy makes me laugh. Dude, that's for sure. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> like, uh, I'm just, I, tell you, I just thought you were going to no, say something bro. very academic <laughs> and serious, Maheen. That, that's no, cause that's what top of my head. Like, how are they going to get in the hellfire? I'm like, that's how. That's the angels throw them in. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. like <laughs> dragged by the, grabbed by the feet, dragged on the face. <laughs> I like how we completely deflected off of Maheen scholar worship, though. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, let's talk about like, well, well, well da, what Mahin, is it? It's not a therapy session. Mahomet, talk about that. Talk. talk like, cause, like, well, uh, let's talk about the uh, the, the story of Ya Abdul Mo- uh, Ya Ya Abdul uh, Haramain. Yeah, yeah, that one. What am I talking about? <laughs> okay, <laughs> Ya Abdul Haramain. No, we're, I'm almost talking. Okay, about, so like, late last night we were, we were having like a, a long WhatsApp discussion. We were just waiting for Fajr. We're actually, I think everyone was in their bed and just chatting away on WhatsApp and. And uh, we were talking about Instead some of the rival. Do you mean? Yeah, so we were talking about some of the rivalries that happen between the scholars and, and the, the people who, who are involved in Dawah. And uh, ah. Sheikh Amr gave us uh, no, the story. I, I of, told them that this, there's a friction that always occurs. It's always going to be there of those people who are kind uh, of active boots on the ground or du'at, g- and those people of academic scholarship, right? G- Gilan, yeah. are you on Twitter uh, still? Are you still off the, the ban? Are you, have you still made no, uh, Twitter I, haram I, on yourself? It's just linked to my Facebook. When I post anything on Facebook, it just shows up there, but I'm not on Twitter. Oh, okay. So you're not, okay. you might not be aware of some of the drama that's going on. But anyway, we were kind of talking about that. What's going on now? <laughs> oh, uh, we'll, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> I don't want the listeners to get involved. All right. in it. Uh-oh. So... <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we're we're talking about some of the rivalry that happens between scholars and and the Islamic activists. And mm. uh, Sheikh Hamid, can you talk yeah, so about? Yes, no, what I was, what I mentioned was I gave him the example of the the qasida that Ibn Kathir mentions, and Ibn Athir mentions the yeah, Abid al Haramain between Fulayl ibn Iyad and Abdullah mm. ibn Mubarak, and that 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 happens for a very specific, distinct reason. And sometimes that has to happen. I believe that that has to happen, but it has to be done with nobility, right? Meaning mm. that it's not like okay, I'm gonna go do this. I'm gonna go go talk to this academic, this scholar, and and butt heads with him because I I really need to. This it, it's actually more natural than that. It shouldn't be intentional, but it happens. It's inevitable mm. that there's people who are active boots on the ground, if you want to say, that are always in touch with people of bringing them to Islam, convincing them of Islam, being concerned with them, and the academics of Islam. If I want to say, you know, and I'm not I'm not saying that in a condescending manner. The academics of Islam and the Quran and the Sunnah are very busy with circles of teaching because that's their passion. They love to see nourishing of the soul, nourishing of of of, of the mind, and and having firsthand and teaching people the Quran and the Sunnah, and it's actually helping themselves more than anybody else. But what mm. happens with the da'i whose boots on the ground sees it as inactivity, 
And the yes. academic sees sometimes a da'i as reckless and too emotional and overzealous, right? Yeah. And that's something that's supposed to be there because they both help each other. They both make each other stronger. That Without the academics yeah. of Islam, the da'i wouldn't have knowledge, right? And without mm-hmm. the without the da'i, the academic wouldn't be concerned, hey, am I doing enough? Am I not doing enough, right? They both need, mm-hmm. they both need each other. It's always there. But where it gets messy is when there's harsh language used and and you start talking about the person himself and and, you know that that becomes a little so even then in the past the way that the poem is 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 mentioned yeah yeah the way the way the way it's worded is is so beautiful you know and and he's not being condescending actually he's actually telling him hey look at our life right our horses are this and your horse that you know you're that you're just using to ride on and the horses that we use, you know, and, and it's just, it, it, it was, it was, it's so beautiful, you know. Do you want to read it? I have it up. Yeah, I don't, I don't have it memorized. Yeah. I just, you know. And, Astaghfirullah. Yeah, Astaghfirullah. Should I have memorized you. You, know, you know, the, the old, yeah, memorize everything. Yeah, I'm, so, alhamdulillah, may Allah make you promise someone day. Yeah, Abid al-Haram, I just pulled it up, 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 yeah, Abid Yes. Man, mashallah, this is a... Yes. He says, um, what, there's a, there were two different... Tra- is this the first translation? Uh, I sent you two separate The first translations. one is better, I think. Sorry. Yeah. Where's the first one? The first one is the one I sent you. Okay. So over here, yeah, my battery just died. But <laughs> so basically he says, um, you know, just to translate for the listeners. Um, o you who worships in the vicinity of the two holy masjids, if you but see us, you will realize that you are only jesting in worship. He who brings wetness to his cheeks with his tears should know that our necks bring wet are being wet by our blood. Mm-hmm. He who tires his horses without purpose, now that our horses are getting tired in battle. Scent of perfume is yours, while ours is the glimmer of the spears and the stench of dust. We were narrated about the speech of our prophet, an authentic statement that never lies. That the mm-hmm. dust that erupts by Allah's horses and which fills the nostrils of men shall never be combined with the smoke of a raging fire. Meaning that fire that you kindle to stay warm at night. This is mm. the book of Allah. This is the book of Allah speaks amongst us. Uh, that the martyr is not dead and the truth in Allah's book cannot be denied. Right? There's another translation which was a lot better than this that I sent. Yeah. But the, the, what, what he's, look, how, look how eloquently he let him know that listen, the work that we're doing, we're in a very dire need right now, right? And you guys are in a very comfortable situation, and that's all he—that's all he said to him, right? But he said it in beautiful words. Yeah. He didn't say, "Oh, mm. you munafiq, you're teaching this and you're you're yeah. doing that and doing something." No, no, no. He such an eloquent way and just letting him know, listen, man, this is this is our world. You know, this this world of ours is a very difficult world that we're living in. A lot of people who listen to this podcast know, like. I mean, they 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 can't tell. They know Mahin loves scholars, and I love Islamic activists. I love Ikhwan Muslimin, Hizb Tahrir. <laughs> I love all these uh, all these groups because I know being with them when I was young. I know some of the yeah. sacrifices. I've seen close friends of ours who went back back home get imprisoned, and uh, and never see their families again. So, uh, like having that first hand knowledge, like they, I have that soft spot for them, you know. And even though I have my own disagreements with them, why I ended up leaving, I will always have that attachment to them because they they were my first introduction to the religion. And of course. Um, with Mahin, his first introduction to the religion was through the uh, Abu Khadijas of the world, <laughs> 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 the, the the hardcore Salafis. So uh, I think w- even when when you kind of joke about them, yeah. y- it's in a more playful manner. You always had that soft spot for them because they. They brought uh, you to the yeah. team, right? Right, right, yeah. right. So I, I think we have a balance on the podcast in that sense. I always have that that inclination to the Islamic movements, and he he always has the the scholarly backing or the scholarly love. I always have a photo that says the Ikhwan from the seventy two deviated sex, <laughs> ready <laughs> to go. 
<laughs> Ladies like, and gentlemen, if you want to know what we discuss and how we joke around <laughs> off mic, this is exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah, we, we 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 were going at it like, like three in the morning last night. It was fun. Yeah. We should but like, yeah. The, head joke, the, the challenge about of the this. activists is that um, sometimes when you're in the middle of something, um, you might miss you you are not going to be uh, totally aware of the trajectory that you might be going in. And so you need somebody outside of that world to tell you when you're going astray. Like, listen, yeah. you're, you've are you gone too far to this end. You need to come back this way. And we see that now a lot with uh, Muslim activists who are not necessarily well-versed in the Sharia, who don't surround them, themselves with teachers, who don't seek counsel. Um, you know, they, they're aligning themselves with groups and with activities that, you know, it's it's. it's but I, these are the activists that Sims talking about. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the Islamic he, activists. He's not talking, <laughs> yeah, he's not who are calling about, for the religion of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to be implemented on Earth. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're not, not talking uh, about. We're, 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 we're talking about activists. We're talking about. Be, S, we ain't talking about SJW leftists. In the yeah, yeah, he's not talking <laughs> about activists to be Muslims so we can somehow be accepted by our fellow yeah. compatriots. We're talking about people who want to establish a caliphate, <laughs> <laughs> like in America. Oh my God, not in America. <laughs> Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> You're trying to become a citizen in this country, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like the scholars. I don't, they don't, they don't you, must be, you must be making mad dua for Duan right now in the AKP in Turkey. <laughs> yeah. you know, but I'm, I'm saying that like that's where um, I think that those are kind of brothers. So, so, so these, these are brothers that like are following the shit like they're religious brothers yeah. right then he's like, not talking about I mean I don't want to mention her name but you know <laughs> <laughs> no need to mention no. her name anymore because I just said her yeah. but yeah. that's not an Islamic activist that's uh, somebody who's who wants uh, acceptance and who wants right. Muslims yeah, to yeah. give so, up so so like like, e- e- like like the activists even I, I would tell like because I, I like I have the relationship with the scholars right so the way this is playing yeah. out I'll tell the scholars like on a, in a PM like hey listen but I know this brother this brother's got a lot of love for the Ummah and stuff and he's like, yeah, but he's still wrong. Like he doesn't know. Like so, it's like people who both love the ummah, right? Yeah. But they're mm-hmm. manifesting itself in different ways. Yeah. Exactly. Like one of them was like the establishment of, like for example, like uh, the the law of Allah is tent is like supreme versus the scholar who will be like, no, we gotta educate the people and like teach them, and then that will just come as a byproduct. And it's and it's not the and if it doesn't happen, it's not like a sin on the ummah, right? Except all that kind of stuff. The problem yeah. with a lot of these activists is if you um I, I, I know just personally from the example of Sudan. You know, back in the eighties I think it was or like seventies when they the new this government that's there right now when they took over in a coup and they mentioned this all this Islamic governance law rule of Allah and and um, you know, establishing justice and all of this stuff and, and they're the most corrupt government in the world oh, today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um so it's it's um the problem with this stuff is that um I really, you know, the hadith is zaif, but its meaning is sound because it's confirmed in the Quran. As you are, you will have people put over you. And all you have to do is look at the, if you want to, if you wonder why the type of governments that we have there today are the way that they are, just look at the individuals, look at the populace, look at the people, look how we conduct our affairs, look at how we interact with our families. So a lot of the scholars, their focus from what I can see is um, they're trying to change what's within Forget about. I mean, there's issues there, but they're trying. They're the ones that I'm aware of. They're they're focusing on yeah. individual change. You change what's within yourself, and then that's going to manifest on a societal scale, and then that will manifest at a governmental scale. Uh, Malik bin Nabi, he's this great Algerian social co- scientist, commentary commentator. Um, Rahim Allah, he was he's one of the most significant uh, Arab intellectuals, and uh, he talks about with regards to the government governance and colonization in the Muslim world today. He said the only reason these colonizers are able to come there is because we have what, what he called qabiliyatul istimar. We have this readiness to become colonized. Hmm. And we need to get rid of that first before we talk about changing governments and things. And so he wants to change mindsets. So the problem with a lot of activists is, um, I mean, this is something that Guy Eden mentions in, in his book, Islam and the Destiny of Man. Revolutionaries forget something that with revolution, it's, a, it's an inherently destructive process. It brings about destruction. And so because destruction is innate to it, it will eventually destroy those who brought it about. And that's what you see with a lot of these people with high aspirations and dreams and they want to establish Islam. They did it through destruction and so they end up destroying themselves and losing their way. Uh, um, and I noticed a lot, you know, there's a lot of bitterness too between the, the Islamic movements and 
uh, the scholars because uh, I think a lot that of the goes not, back to the collusion of the scholars. Talk about collusion, you guys in the states with Russia and stuff, but collusion of the scholars with the government. Exactly, scholars have always been independent from the government, but ever since the advent of the nation state and bringing about religious inst institutions under the auspice and under the umbrella of governance, and so now you have the rulers de deciding which uh, form of Islam to, prom to propagate. So that's where that distrust comes about now. I can't trust you as a scholar because you're just you know, singing the, you know, tweeting the horn of the the, the ruler. And, and what you just said about how as you are is what your rulers are above you, it, it also speaks to the fact that we have uh, some governments who have, uh, you know, a, an illusion of an Islamic government, right? They make mm. it seem like they put some of the window dressing on and make it seem like, oh, we're an Islamic government. But it's, it speaks to our condition as a people where we lie to ourselves about the truth mm -hmm. like w even w the way we understand islam we uh, cherry pick and we um, lie to ourselves in the nature of our belief and that's and why i love what ortogro said in one of the episodes mm. before he killed uh, uh one of the uh traitors he said you're gonna you're gonna kill me over a christian and ortogro's response was I will not forgive a traitor even if it was my own brother. Allah. And I will help the oppressed even if it was a disbeliever. Wow. wow. And my enemy. That's such a yeah. seerah. That's such a, that's the ruh of the seerah, man. That's the spirit of the Sim didn't get there yet. Sim's still like waiting for, season four ended, by the way. You, oh, yeah, you I can know. start binging. The whole series ended. I know, I know. It did, it did end. Um, you I it's think. It's a permanent end now? But you guys, you guys go through all these like weird links to. To access season four, don't you? Ah, uh, historical fun subscription. <laughs> historical. Where, where where do you get that? Facebook. My daughter knows this. I don't know. Yeah, this she, I, I, saw, I saw her like last weekend, <laughs> and I and I gave her like the so you know his daughter was in the Eternal fan video. Yeah, 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 I and like uh, <laughs> and like so I see her so now. I, I was I, I was like she's like eight, what nine or eight? Eight. I like put my hand on the chest, like nod to her. She like responds back, and I was like, and <laughs> I just finished. Ella. I finished you, last. You, you know, Gilad, she comes up to me and she kisses my hand and puts it on her forehead. <laughs> oh, just that into the show, man. Yeah, yeah, I was actually surprised how much he was into it, man, and like all the names and yeah. I I, I had no idea an eight year old would have that cognitive understanding shh, to shh. understand all the plots and the schemes that are happening in this series. Man. She, she, she was showing um Sheikh Amr one day like how uh Ertural sword technique when he beheads Gumistek and yeah, I remember that. <laughs> it's like you gotta see this, you gotta see this. I was like, is this really happening? How is she so into this? Yeah, like my, my daughter's into it now. She's my daughter's favorites. Like, so th there's a scene where Noyan does the head bob. You know what I'm talking about? My yeah, daughter yeah. loves that, that scene. My amazing. my daughter just he she asked for that on repeat, and she just like starts I love laughing. Profession. I like Noyan now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I was like so. I don't want to offer any spoilers, right? Yeah, no, no, no. I think the listeners don't want any spoilers because, but but how do how do they get historical fun? Did where what okay, website is that? It's it's on Facebook. It's a Facebook page, so you have to be on Facebook. You go to historical fun. Uh, but now they it should be all free because the subscription gate got us to episodes like pretty soon after the actual release. So you had to pay before uh, in order to get the. So, uh, in order to get the episodes quickly, correct, correct. Because otherwise, you'd be waiting maybe two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. And I was getting them right. I was getting them pretty quick. And um, it only paid me. I only paid like ten bucks. Yeah. For like half a. Cause I, I got on the subscription midway through season four when I was like running out. And then I was like, wow. all right, I'll just pay for it. It's like ten bucks. Um, <laughs> and that was it. That was is it, it on? Do you know if uh, W Lex is all caught up? I don't think so. They're not. Oh, okay. They're still not caught up. Dang. So you're waiting for them to get caught up? That's where I would, you know. Yeah, but you can start now. I mean, what are you going to do? Like, watch like 40 hours? I binge hours. it, man. <laughs> when I binge, <laughs> I binge. Right now, I've been busy with work. No, but there, there's a. I've been trying to get a promotion, so. But, I have to say, this is this is a Joe Rogan experience podcast for sure. <laughs> but, but, We've but, gone through so many different topics. But, but <laughs> there's, a, there's a trailer. Uh, I saw the historical fun release for season five, but I think it's supposed to be Dirlis Osman. From what I hear. Mm. Yeah, Dirlis Osman is the next one. They actually had to pay. Uh, engine, because uh, uh, the the people the they there was like a boycott uh, campaign against Arturo. What? Why? Why? Okay, like I don't want to spoil it, but somebody oh. dies, and if everybody was very sad about it, very, people were upset because it was historically inaccurate to talk, and they loved this person. Yeah. So there was a campaign to boycott Arturo, and the plan was to have everybody die off at the end of the season. 
What? And so they had to readjust the writing and they had to rehire engine apparently for another uh, eight, like eight episodes or something for the next season and age him so that they can set the stage up for Osman. Mm. So, so he will be acting partially in season five then. Yeah, the first few episodes he'll be there and he'll be older. They have they've already done kind of a makeup thing for him and stuff. Okay. And, oh, that's insane. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's wow. it should, it should be I, good. Well, I'm glad they boycotted him because I would not be happy if they did that. Yeah, the writer had to like they had to readjust things because there were people were very upset. Because that but that actor was didn't that individual like just bail like oh I'm out or like no no this individual said that um when they when they were asked are you going to be continuing and and they said. I don't know, like it's it's up to the director and the producer. And then when they were asked afterwards, they said the director had a different direction that they were going in, especially with Osman coming up. And so they decided to just, you know, so end my oh, involvement in the series. Oh, so the the, the, the actor <laughs> themselves didn't want to be in. Like who's like who's the who's the because like the actor the, themselves was happy to continue all the way to the end. OK, so. Yeah. OK, so the director. Was it Mehmet Boz- yeah. Bozdak? Boz- sir, the Mehmet. Yeah, apparently that's who takes the blame for setting that up. Mm. Oh man. Yeah, it was like you gotta it, 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 added, it added this like this unnecessary twist to everything, right? Because yeah, it was not needed at all. Yeah, it was so unnecessary. It's uncalled for. Right. Oh. Sorry, it, 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 it's is, it's the one thing in season four. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm season, learning. <laughs> the, the whole the whole show, right, was pretty much on point. But those couple episodes. Like from Bolum, like one sixteen, one seventeen was just like yeah. It was like a dip. It, I think it ended well. A lot of people were upset how it ended, but I, 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 I was good with how it ended. Yeah, I was good with how it ended as well. Even the way that they handled the death. Yeah, there was a lot of amazing lessons to be derived from it. That it was quite impressive the way that they did it. Even though I hated it. Yeah. It was still impressive how they handled it. Yeah. Because they taught people about. Allah, about tawakkul, about like who's the real uh, provider, all of that stuff is is amazing. Mm-hmm. You, got, you guys have inspired my curiosity to insane levels now. Who who's the one who died? <laughs> yeah, and it's like it, it, it'll it'll come out of nowhere you know? too. Oh man, it's it's not gonna yeah. be like yeah, it it kind of like so I, I kind of realized because I was watching the I subscribed to one of the Instagram ch- ch- channel I think Daryless Daryless on Instagram. Yeah, and it was like uh, trying to see. And they, unfortunately, they were giving away like spoilers and stuff. So, um, you know, it was just like, and I kind of got an idea. And then I asked one of my friends, "Is this person I better not really have died?" And he's like, "Yeah, they did." Oh, and I was like, "Dang it!" <laughs> you know, I, I'm, like, I'm like, "That's not even right." Like, you know, that based on, I don't, we don't, we don't know that much about Ertero, but like based upon, like, you know, so, so ba- based on what you guys are saying, you're saying that. We, they they still haven't decided for next season. No, I think they whether, have. Seems like they have, right? So so that death will be permanent. They have. They're paying Elgin. He's gonna get paid like one hundred twenty thousand liras per episode, and no, no, he he he's gonna get paid. But that one, that other actor, or uh, they're they're going that to that actor is not gonna come back. No, because oh, they so died, they're going. It's gonna so... be a permanent death. Oh my god. Yeah, they killed him. No. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know who it is, but I'm already upset. Yeah, it, it was. I'm def- very upset. No, it, it it was definitely. Uh, but it, you know, oh, overall, like now there's that new show coming out. Uh, I think historical fun with Gundogo's character and some of Manchel's character. Uh, yeah, which I'm probably gonna get into after the World Cup. Man, I, I wish I could do all of this stuff, but I've I've limited myself to just Ortoral. Wait, Gundogo's gonna going happen? No, no, life th- to do that. Th- 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 there's <laughs> another show by the same produ- by the same producer, I think. With um, it's a it's it's about the modern like the latter day Ottoman Empire. Mm. It's like about some war that happened, either in the eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds. Yeah, yeah. Fr- Kutel Amara is the Arabic translation for it, but I'm not sure what's name it. Yeah, uh, in terms of- I don't know what the historical like like backdrop is, but Suleiman Shah's yeah. character is um there, and then Gundogo's character is there. Mm. there I think Gundogo's yeah. character is like the Sultan or something. So I'm not sure. I I didn't get to see much of it. Yes. Uh, Dr. Ghilan, have yeah. you watched the Arturul in the Arabic, Arabic dubbed Arturul? I I caught like a scene of it and I was disgusted. <laughs> oh, it was it was not a good translation or whatever. Oh, it's terrible the the dubbing because it's in like a Syrian like accent. It's just weird. Oh, oh I see what you're saying. <laughs> okay, okay, I see. It's mm-hmm. just weird, and plus you you miss out on all the realism of the tone and all of that stuff. So. I prefer to just read the the Arabic subtitles. Yeah, I, I tried to watch it in a Bangla dubbing one episode in season one, 
and Ibn Arabi, they, they, they gave him the vo- the voice of like some guy with laryngitis. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, yeah, I could never do that. Even with like anime and stuff like that, I don't know if you guys ever watch anime. Do you guys watch Jap- Japanese anime? Those big eyes freak me out. Give me oh, seizures. Come on, man. <laughs> Listeners, you guys know my pain. Like I these guys Akira. never understand any of my references. I saw Akira once. Akira is that oh, that's, is that a store for like women's clothing? No. Akira? No, that's a singer. That's a singer you're talking about. No, Akira. There's a show called. There's a store. Oh, I don't. I didn't you're know talking about Shakira. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's not Shakira. Shakira. <laughs> Shakira. Yeah, Shakira. Oh, so l- let me ask you, how how your social media fast been going? Like this is a permanent. This isn't like a, a a temporary thing. Your idea, your intent is to be off the gram and Twitter and all this stuff like for good, right? So I, I left Instagram for good completely. I deleted that, like, so I'm not there anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, Instagram I left as well. Uh, I mean, Twitter I left. I, I I initially deleted it, but then just from you no know, numerous people, I said I'll just leave it up at least for you know the content that's there already. And for there are people who don't have Facebook and they just only know about events and appear. You know, whenever I go visit some place, they only know about it through Twitter. So I have Facebook and Twitter linked that way. So I announce it on Facebook. If there's any post that I need to post for whatever reason, it's linked to Twitter anyway, so people can read it that way. Um, but it's been great, man. It's um, there's a quote by Denzel Washington: "If you follow the, if you don't know, if you don't follow the news, you're not, you're you're misinformed, or you're not informed. And if you follow the news, you're disinformed. So one thing that I picked out from it is." Um, I'm I'm actually I'm a lot more peace uh, even in my Quran recitation my prayers everything there, there's just less clutter I'm a lot I'm a I'm a lot more clear headed and mm. when I and I notice about myself also I mean I, the reason I left it is due to counsel but now I'm noticing the impact and why that counsel came to me to leave it because I was starting to counsel meaning lawyer have, speak to you. <laughs> What's that? No, no. Did lawyers speak to you? No. Attorneys? No, no, no. no. <laughs> counsel. That's, that's what you, counsel. Like a te- teacher. Like okay, Jackson. well, I have to be the and voice of. The, I have to why be. Why would a lawyer look, tell him to get off social media? Look, What's that? I, I have to be the inner voice of the listener. Okay. So yeah. sometimes I ask no, dumb no, questions. It was, it was no, advice when, from yeah. Sheikh that you know, and the reason I got that is because it was uh, you know. It was impacting my my behavior. So it, it was noticeable in my in my talk, in the way that I interacted. There was something different about me that I wasn't aware was happening. Then I was told, "It's time for you to lay off of this and get off of this." That's why you need and a so just I murabbi, and man. when I did that, everyone needs a huh? just murabbi, man, to tell them what to do. You know. Yeah, that's the that's the idea. It wasn't like even an order or a command. They just said, "Just but, counsel for your own sake. You need to get off of this." Here, here. Do they, did, do they fully understand? What it is though, because sometimes oh, some yeah, of the, yeah, the yeah. scholars they like ah this technology stuff you don't want you don't need it anyway. No, I, what no, are you no, doing, no, Zulan? No, about that. It's, you need to you study with to, us a little bit more. Again, back to faqid <laughs> shay la yurti. The one that's how scholars something cannot give something. <laughs> Sim, no, listen. First and foremost, you're not talking to somebody who's in twelfth grade or, or no, Shahamir. You know some of the teachers we studied with. They okay. they would say like, what I are you doing on this that. computer? Clickety clacky, <laughs> you know, like, they're typing up letters. No, that's not it, dude. Do you think this is dawa? <laughs> this is not dawa. Dude, you have to understand. <laughs> this is Dr. Muhammad Ghilan we're talking about. I'm, his murabi is going to be at a whole different level, son. I thought his murabi wouldn't be in a desert or something. No, no, <laughs> no. Hey, uh, um, doctor, I'm sorry about this this ignorant. Uh, Republican speech here, uh, this <laughs> rhetoric. Just forgive him, please. Yeah, no, it's um, no, it's 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 just it. It was impacting my own behavior, my own is presence, my own being. It was just something that only somebody outside it, of it, me who it impacts you know, everyone. And, and I think people just choose to ignore it because they're so so addicted to their phones. And yeah, the, I, I know just with with me and my wife, the amount of stress that comes from uh, Facebook and. Twitter, well, just the reading the, the amount of ne- negative publicity every day. Yeah, and okay. the one thing I was told about it as well is um, you need to recognize, like, once you start to believe yourself being that important, that is a bad sign. Mm, because if true. Allah wants to guide people, he will guide people, and he will bring people to you. If he wants to guide people through you, they will be brought to you. So I, it, was just, that... it, was, it was having a very – the negative was outweighing the positive. You know, everything that you engage in has its aspect, and it was not doing good service to my being. So 
I left it and, you know, just leaving it now for the last uh, couple of months, I'm noticing like my revision of the Quran is a lot clearer. I'm not struggling. Um, prayer is I'm a lot more present and I'm, I don't have clutter and thoughts coming into my mind that was just, you know, Twitter, the stream of Twitter was becoming more ever present in my mind all the time. Um, dramas that you. come and go. I mean, there's always a drama on Twitter. There's always something happening. Yeah. Um, and it, it comes up and it goes away and it's like, did really something change? Did, so I left all of that and subhanAllah, literally within a week of leaving it, I started getting requests from local people um, between Sydney and Brisbane to come and do classes. Like that five uh, session se uh, series that I did covering Imam al-Ghazali's uh, text from the Ihya, that came after I got off of social media, off of Twitter. Um, then Sydney, a group of uh, wonderful brothers and sisters there running on Mizan uh, Avenue there, um, invited me to come over and we've got a couple more sessions, retreats that are being organized. And then I, I basically started to become more present with people in my locality. Even there is a group at the university here, uh, young Muslims, they have their own set. Every two weeks they have a gathering of just like young Muslims, let's cut. can we just have a, 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 you know, a session with you and just have a Q&A? And so now I'm present with people physically. Um, in person and there's a, a greater impact to that than you know 20,000 followers or whoever you know nameless people that you don't know about you don't, I know that it has an impact I have been getting messages and the difficulty for me was I got messages from people I meet people even now as I travel to different places and I get told like Jazakallah khair, you know, it was great, you know, it's your writings, your videos, your podcast, it's been really helpful to me. I've been So that's the difficulty for me. It's like, man, I, should I really leave all of that? I didn't really leave it. I've basically limited my own engagement because it was harming me. I'm still putting out the content, but I'm doing it at a more uh, selective pace, slower, and I'm putting more thought into it. And it's not impacting my relationship with Allah anymore in the way that it was. And I wasn't noticing, I wasn't aware of it until I actually, when I was told it really troubled me. It's like, what? Like, I'm changing that to that degree. I need to leave. Well, I was, uh, I met one of my friends uh, last night who listens to both our shows. And he thinks that one of the reasons you left is after the Ertugrul show, we started talking about like the, the actresses and who was the finest one. And he was like, <laughs> that probably like, he probably was like, dang, these Mad Mum looks like took me down to gutter of their like, you know, deplorable speech. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. That's not that's not the reason. It's just it's amazing. I mean, I used to do a fast every year anyways. I used to go in Ramadan and I would just take off mm. every Ramadan. And I would stop for a month and I would feel like a positive experience from it. But I don't know. Recently, it's just been really more. I've been just too involved with it. Have and, you thought um, about doing Umrah during Ramadan? What's that? Have you have you done uh, Umrah during Ramadan? Uh, a couple of years back, I did. Yeah, that's the last ten nights. We we have a, a group that goes every year um, through one of our uh, our friends. Uh, we we go together, and <clears throat> I can I can't tell you. Just I've done it twice, or, or sorry, I'd have done it once. I think sorry, done it once, and uh, it was just the most amazing experience in my life. I, oh, it's I, beautiful. If, there. if it's any beautiful listeners are contemplating going to do Umrah during Ramadan, uh. But, Make sure you you think about it for next year. Make sure you save mm -hmm. now. Start saving now, and, and it's not that expensive actually. It's what, no. Uh, it, I'd also just uh just a final thought on that yeah. uh, the social media thing. I actually changed my whole interaction with the phone itself. It's not just cutting off the media. So every evening now at about nine p.m., I turn it on airplane mode. Mm -hmm. So like nobody can get a hold of me until the next morning after like, after I finish my adhkar. Mm. Once I finish my Quran and Athkar and everything after Subah, if I have another commitment, I don't turn it on. I finish any commitments I have in the morning, but the earliest I will turn it on in the morning is around 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. And so I have from 9 p.m. until that time, nothing. And then when I go into classes, I put it on airplane mode. When I go and have lunch or dinner or coffee with anybody, I turn it off as well. And so I make a point of like whenever I'm engaged with somebody because I want to be present with that person, I don't even pull it up on the table. Just put it in airplane mode, turn it off, and just be with the person. And I've noticed like just my – it does have an impact on you. This thing, its presence is harmful to your relationships in, in very subtle ways. Just the idea of just having it on yeah, man. is problematic. You yes. know, and, and I know a lot of listeners are going to be thinking right now, oh, you know, I can't do that. But because I have my work phone, my work email attached to my phone, 
Get another you phone. Know what? I'm, th- I'm like, actually the world as is you not were speaking. Collapse. Yeah. It's not going to end if you don't respond right away. Yeah. Um, and so I don't. I just leave it. And I even my email. I check my email once a day, and that's it. I used to check it all the time. Refresh, refresh. You know, just check it. Just sign it. I don't do that anymore. I just have a set time in the day. I check it. The rest of the time, it's amazing how much free time you get from it. Yeah. And how much more you're able to accomplish. Had it not been for me leaving all of this stuff, you know, I'm I'm actually working on now uh, with the uh, Al Hikam Institute in Brisbane. We're gonna start recording uh, translation and commentary on all 40 books of the Ihya. Yeah. yeah. Mashallah. Of Imam Ghazali's and just putting that out. I would not, I like the time I was spending on social media and the phone and just being engaged with all that stuff, it just, there was nothing of real heavy substance that I was able to accomplish out of it. And right. now that I have that time set aside, it's basically you have a choice. There's only so much time in the day. You have a choice. Do you want to spend it wisely and do something of substance that you can leave behind? Yeah. Or you just want to waste it in these like short tweets and dramas that arise here and there and yeah you know and, and, and you know I, just as you're speaking i'm thinking how i'm going to implement this because i i literally can't um can disconnect from my work email because literally the company will burn down if i don't respond uh, mm. not, not literally but in terms i handle all the it systems in our company and if something's down then the whole company's down and it's like sixty thousand uh-huh. employees around the world so wow this, um that's uh, a responsibility. So what I would what I would do is I would probably dedicate another phone, one of my older phones, sp- yeah. to my email, and Ooh. keep my regular phone disconnected on airplane mode. I think that that's might be a good one. That, that's yeah. a that's a wonderful idea that you've had because that I know if an emergency comes up, that phone will ring, but then anything non-emergency can wait. Yeah, because I've contemplated this idea for a long time, just getting disconnected. No, it is, man. I'll tell you why. Yesterday I went to a party, right? I went to a party through my in-laws. And what I've been doing for the past, ever since Ramadan, is anytime I go to a party, I just leave my phone in the car. And you realize how much more interactive you are. Because what happens when party's a little down and someone, you just want to check your phone real quick and yeah. people start yeah. talking to you and you're looking at that, you don't realize how rude that is, man. But sometimes people are so boring, though. No, it's not about that. Let them be boring, <laughs> but that's that's our I social mean, atmosphere. Serious, like... <laughs> I, I have I have, a, I have an answer to that, but I'm saying we've become so non-social even though we're in a social gathering. That's problematic. And really think about it, honestly. If someone's talking to you, and I'm guilty of this too, you're doing mm. something else and you're talking to them and you're looking at the screen at the same time. Honestly, dude, that's yeah. kind of disrespectful, bro. Yeah. You know, that is. But we it's do it. Everyone does it because it's so normal now. Mm-hmm. It's normalized. Yeah. Right? Well, and look at the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So Whenever he would speak to someone, he would turn with his whole being towards that person. Exactly. And then that person would feel like they were the most important person in the world. Exactly. That's a part of the fitrah, to feel important, right? It, it's yeah. To, it's to so make people feel important. Same thing you do with your phone. Just turn it off. Put it away. Oh, man. Pay I've, attention to people. Be I've present. Done, I've done it to Sheikh Hamar so many times. <laughs> I've been playing on like video games uh, on the phone. <laughs> What was like, it? Wait, those were video games? I thought you were doing something important. You look like you had the important face on. No, no, no. That was a me. When I make a serious face, that's me playing video games. Everything else first is like all, all comical. Gotta, first of all, you guys got to stop calling me Sheikh, man. We're we're in the presence of a real Sheikh, and you guys are talking. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Just stop it, bro. Um, so no, it's it's you know get get off of this stuff. I I really highly recommend it. And you'll get into deeper work states. You'll be able to accomplish more. If you're trying to memorize the Quran, you'll be having an easier time doing it. Um, you'll be able to pray in a more in a more present state. And by the way, like even with prayer, people wonder, oh, I, I'm not feeling presence in my prayer. I can't. Well, if your whole day is is filled with distracting yourself all the time and being active all the time, yeah. where you don't have a moment of just let's just sit down in silence. And then you enter into prayer from distraction, and then you you expect that immediately you should go into a state of serenity. That's a hard order to fill. Of course, man. So you should have moments in your day where just know. relax, just chill. You know, you don't have to do anything. You're right, man. The thing is, so itikaf, right? I thought I was, I had some like um, preconceived. I, I've never even done like a 24 hour itikaf before this mm. uh, this year, right? So like I thought that, and I definitely wanted to leave my phone in the car and have this like flip phone, whatever. I thought I'd be tripping, like, my nuts would be tripping the first couple of days, but it wasn't. It was fine. But, like, mm. after, like, you know, after we did cut them, then you're just trying to chill. Like, I remember, like, I was having, like, I was having withdrawal, like, on day seven and yeah. eight. Not, like, in day one. But, like, yeah, at, the same, it works. at the same time, it was, like, I was, remember, I remember I'd be reading Quran, and, like, these random flashbacks from, like, ten years ago popping in my head. Yep. That yeah. would be coming in, because, like, because I'm, like, all of a sudden, I don't I guess because it's not... Because I'm not consuming information, 
Because there's only it, the Moshe did itikaf in. There's only like including myself, only five brothers did itikaf. Oh wow! So it was like there were days where I didn't talk to anybody either, and so you have these random Shut flashbacks up. and stuff. Of random, yeah. I had I had this weird trippy dream. I had this one dream where um I was helping Michael Jordan with his gambling problem. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, it's and then a lot because like you know it was like something like stuff. Wouldn't you know, it be it's... funny if your dream was happening in a multiverse? Like it was something that you were doing in another universe? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that I was, would be amazing. Yeah, like I was I was helping him on his PR campaign because because he was getting all his bad pub during his gambling crisis. And it was weird because, like, it's not like I was reading about his gambling stuff anytime, even when it happened back in the 90s. I didn't care about it. Like, he's played good basketball. Like, I was a kid in high school, right? Um, so it was just interesting. Like, some really off the wall thing, off the wall stuff happening, right? Wow. You know? That's insane. But then the, uh, but I was just like, it was like the withdrawal period. And then when I got my phone back, so the Itikaf, Itikaf technically ends, right? Um, I think Thursday night. Uh, yeah. like, I guess the, when they see the moon, right? But then I remember, yeah. um, I think some of the Shayuk say that, like, one of the lost Sunan is the stay the night of Eid, that you should still stay. So I stayed, yeah. but then I had a kid go get me the phone from my car, um, once the Itikaf ended. So I remember, like, yeah. for an hour, I was, like, just catching up, like, 1800 messages and stuff. And 1800. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> I, 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 this is what, uh, I don't know if you guys know Sheikh Mukhtar Maghrawi is. Of course, yeah, yeah. Of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's the guy who, uh, from Algeria. Oh, yeah, so Omar Mukhtar, right? He's not, <laughs> not Omar Mukhtar. Mukhtar. No, 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 no. no? Not, um, Mukhtar was not in Algeria. Uh, Omar Mukhtar was Libyan, Mukhtar right? Was in Libya, yeah. Oh, yeah, Mukhtar yeah. Lion of the desert. No, we're not talking about Lion of the desert. He's talking about the Lion of Canada. He's, he's, oh, <laughs> he's in Turkey right now. Anyways, <laughs> he, <laughs> he just was... got an experience of of what it is to live with Sim. He had to laugh while he was talking. He goes, anyways, I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to stoop to this level. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mean, I understand. Don't worry. I understand. I, I got to figure uh, it out. No, Sheikh Mukhtar was saying, he was commenting on when people, uh, he's like, when you break your fast, don't break your fast with vengeance. SubhanAllah. And so Nahin was just breaking his fast with the phone with vengeance. <laughs> yeah. Sim, you were talking about it. There was one of the iftars where you broke your iftar with vengeance. Oh, right? You took, you said you took you one. Know, you know, every, I, I listened to uh, all of your, uh, you know, Ramadan series. Yeah. And, uh, well, for the listeners, if you haven't, if you want to learn about just um, eating in general and your relationship with food, please go and um, listen to uh, Dr. Gilan's, uh, how, what is it, three-part series or five, five parts? Five. Five-part series, five. right? Five. Okay, I must have stopped at three. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm the, the first three were Kitabu Kasir Kasir yeah. Shahwatain, the book of breaking the two desires, and the last two are Kitabu Asrar al Som, the book um, of the secrets of fasting, both make, from the Ahi al Madin. Make sure you listen to those episodes; they're jewels. Um, Mashallah, you did a fantastic job on those. But mm-hmm. all those episodes were ringing through my head. But when I saw the amazing food my mom made, I couldn't help myself, <laughs> and I just destroyed it. He said, I took vengeance on my stomach. <laughs> I still remember your message. <laughs> Guys, I took vengeance on my stomach today. <laughs> it, it, it's it, it, like, it, like the food thing is like so, like, it's so hard, man. Like, I, I like, it, like, the, the thing we, is, we, you're, we, like, we know you're right. <laughs> we know you're right, but we've made food into such a science that we've perfected the, uh, the recipes to the maximum potential that of it can be perfected. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, taste buds. You, like, human beings Bro, back then I, were I, had. You, I'll if you presented a plate of biryani to the Arabs week. back then, they would have all been fat. Well, 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 sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. What was that? No, my father was visiting me last week because he wanted. He's never been to Australia. He wanted to see, like, oh, where's my son living and what's he up to and stuff. So he comes here, and it was a al maftuh for me. It was this al maftuh. I didn't care. This whole week he was here, and of course his dad, right? So he's just like, let's go to this restaurant, that restaurant, that restaurant, and he's like, I'll, and so he's paying, of course, and. Like, all right, <laughs> I'll take this, I'll take that, I'll take that. <laughs> and then we'll finish off with this dessert. And he's like, I'm noticing that you uh, just uh, no control there. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you're here, you know, it's out normally of love. I'll be fasting, I'll be doing something, I'll be controlling myself, but you're only here for a week. If you were living here, different story. But just for the sake of your visit, I'm going to leave it open. Man. Man. Yeah, it was like the one that I went to my friend invited. I told myself this year, no, no Ramadan buffets, right? But then, yeah. you know, in the middle of the day in Ramadan, you're like, get craving. You start acting up. Yeah. And you make the most irrational decisions because I swore, to, <laughs> I swore to myself last year because when I went to a Ramadan buffet, they had awful food. And it's been like two, three times I went to these restaurants and they have very mediocre food for their Ramadan buffets. And I swore to myself this year, I'm not going to go to a Ramadan buffet. But what did I do? 
I made an ir- irrational decision and went to one and completely regret- regretted it. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's like you're paying like 30 bucks and then like, tire away, forget it. I mean, there's no impossible. Yeah, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? That was my incentive. I, you know, and to my family too, I said, listen, and I, I'm, I don't mean to be the party pooper here, guys. I apologize, but I think this is a very important message. Uh, mm. Not because I'm saying it because one of my teachers told me this before too, and it makes a lot of sense to me, is that the only time of the year where it's easy to go to Isha and do Qiyam al-Layl is in Ramadan. The yeah. only thing that's going to stop you from doing that is overeating. So the yep. one month that you have that you're going to be in much more control and you're going to be inclined to pray in the masjid, this overeating, what it does, it actually makes you hate. And I hate to say this, but it makes you hate praying, especially Salat al-Isha. Yeah. It becomes a burden, right? And for me, that became, I'm not saying this to be a party pooper. This is an incentive for me not to overeat. Yeah, after Tarawiyah, that's where I would kind of, you know, go to town sometimes, right? But what happens mm-hmm. is that, man, you know. Not on Devon, baby. Yeah. yeah. After, for Sahur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have, have, you know, three dates, you know, max with a glass of water or milk or whatever. You know, go pray Maghrib. You come back, you're not even that hungry. And then you eat yeah. a little bit. What happens is, man, when you use your psyche to be mentally hungry and you gorge on food then, bro, it's over. Your Isha, two cups of coffee is not even going to help. And then you're no. just Isha and you can't wait for it to be finished. It'll man. be like that's, that dude. That's a crime. Too, Muhammad, so. did you listen to the sh- podcast we did with a Shaq, John War Fitness? Yeah. And he talks really about the, the uncle that like threw up. In, <laughs> he's like, he threw up all this rice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, dang. <laughs> like that day I went to Bawadi for the buffet. I would have like thrown up if I if I even like I remember it's like almost it's at a point where I think when I cause I was like you're in line right and you're yeah. like you now you have a remember for last year I was like Tarawi tonight's not happening you already chuck up the L like it's not <laughs> happening <laughs> <laughs> I was like it's game one of the finals today it's all right I'll I'll miss today <laughs> that's, you know, that's, you know, honestly that's... it's um uh, for me it's just um. Uh, that it's so important for me to get through like uh, the Quran, the recitation, the prayers, all of that stuff. Um, having experienced, like I, I try to register in my mind when things become difficult and when it comes to food. And uh, for me, I'm willing to sacrifice that meal for the sake of just being able to recite in peace. Because when I'm filled up, it's really hard to get through. Like if, especially if you're trying to do multiple khatams, that means you're going to have to sit there and recite a lot and you know go through all this stuff. It's just too difficult. You know, it's, uh, I'd rather not eat. All right. Well, we're going to go and wrap it. So first of all, uh, like I went through a lot for you today because I was fasting and I broke my fast three hours ago with three dates and the food, real food just showed up. <laughs> oh, mashallah. So no, I had to make up fast. Accept. There was one day I, I was dehydrated. And, and I was getting like cramps, so I had to break. So uh, the six days of Shawwal right now. So I, I'm not on six of Shawwal yet. He's making up his. Uh... I, I I missed one fast, so I made I made up that t- today was my makeup day. Ah, he was sick. Yeah, I was like dehydrated. Uh, I was that just day. gonna say it wasn't that time of the month for you. Kilad busting out the humor. Oh, oh man, snaps. ruthless. <laughs> uh, I, I asked. Uh, I remember I was thinking about you this morning because like this fast today's fast was rough, and I was like, man, I don't want to do six of Shawal. I was like, didn't Imam Malik say that Shawal fasting was makru? And then I asked. Uh, so, like uh, she- I asked Sheikh Hamza Makbul that I texted him. I was like, and he's like, yeah, but the Madhab says it's not because. Uh, during the time of Malik, everybody was making it. And I, I remember you talking about how, like, we use convenient Sharia loopholes when we want. Like, we won't fast exactly. the end of uh, of Shaban because we was like – and you're like, that's for everybody who fasts normally, right? So yeah, yeah. I was like, dang. I, was, I thought about you, to, like, because I was like, dang, I got to still, like, somehow bust out these six of Shawel after. How do man? You know, inshallah. All right, inshallah. so uh, – I appreciate you, uh, you coming Thank on. Thank you so much for your time. You spent, um, listeners don't know. Jazakallah this, khaira. this was wonderful. I really, this was my favorite uh, episode so far because it was less academic and more fun. Uh, hopefully that the listeners come this far and listen to all this. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, yeah, and definitely you, Andalus Book Club Online. What's your website? AndalusOnline.com, right? So it's AndalusOnline.org. Yeah. Um, much of what I do now is, um, so I've, I'm, Today is, was my second day. We we're doing a three-day webinar where um, I'm covering Islam and the destiny of man okay. by Guy Eaton. That's all recorded, um, so, right? Because I, I, I've been pay, I, I've been a subscriber, a member for years since like January. But I'll be yeah. honest, I haven't done anything. I I, I, I just buy the books and they sit on my in my shelf. So it's all recorded, <laughs> yeah. and and for the sake of those like Mahin who don't read the books, <laughs> uh, the web 
the webinars actually go through important passages, important chapters, you know, and just comment on them and stuff. So, and all that is recorded. So there's like a good video library now of all books from last year, as well as books from this year, as well as some short courses that I've recorded there. So that's actually much of the content that I put out now is there, as well as the podcast, of course. You know, Muhammad Ghailan, if they search on iTunes and Stitcher, or whatever podcast app they use, you can find it there. All right, man. Jazakallah khair. We'll look forward to chat with you soon. Again, Dr. Man, it was honestly an honor to have you again. Hopefully there's a little It was more. a pleasure having you again, Sheikh Ahmed. No, I really is... appreciate you showing up this time. Last time with our total roundtable, you weren't there, and I was kind of sad. Yeah, I'm well, kind of a loser. I don't know anything about it, you know, so. He's, he's still on episode right, four. Know. I three. I saw three episodes. Three episodes. <laughs> <laughs> He's we will forgive you for that. Arturo hasn't gone to Aleppo yet. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. You know, so, all right. For listeners up there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at the Mad Mamluks use Arabic at use. gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Give us a five star review on iTunes. Uh, for our special guest, Dr. Mohammed Gilan, and my co hosts. Sheikh Amr Said and Sim, this is Mahin signing off for the Mad Mamluks. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah.